turn the volume up a little bit. Okay, so here we go, investing for beginners. Um, so my name is Jonah Lupton. Uh, this idea kind of came to me about a month and a half ago when the whole GameStop Reddit thing was going on and you know, all over CNBC and all over the media, we're watching you know, young people um, start buying into these momentum stocks or Momo stocks, meme stocks, whatever you want to call them. And it was really, it was just completely irrational for some of these, you know, what were four, five, six dollar stocks to be trading up in the 200, 300, 400 dollar range. And I just saw so much bad behavior from young people that really didn't have any experience investing. And some of them might have gotten out at the right time and made some money. And I think a lot of people got in late and ended up losing a lot of money. And it just, it kind of bothered me that uh, our school systems, whether that's middle school, high school, college, they don't do a, a good job of teaching younger people uh, how to invest. You know, what are stocks, bonds, and mutual funds? How do you, you know, where do you open an account? What is, you know, what are different investment strategies? And I didn't learn that. You know, I learned this stuff by being in the business. Um, but young people, for the most part, are getting out of college, going off and starting a job, and they have no idea how to invest. And then by that point, you know, they've already missed, you know, three, four, five years of potential investing and growing a portfolio. And then they get into their 30s and 40s, and they've still done very little in terms of investing. And now they're, you know, way behind, and it's hard to play catch up. And sometimes when you're trying to play catch up, you take too much risk, you're too aggressive. Uh, and then you suffer big losses because of it. And that's not gonna, that's not helping you either. So, you know, just to kind of give you a little background on me, then we'll dive into these slides. Um, when I got out of college, I started working at a firm called Morgan Stanley uh, in their wealth, wealth management group. So I did that for a few years. And then I worked at another wealth management company called uh, Smith Barney. Uh, so I was primarily managing uh, assets or accounts for high net worth individuals, as well as institutions, uh, foundations, nonprofits, et cetera, pension plans. And after about 10 years of doing that, uh, this is 2011, I just got kind of burned out. You know, this was after the financial crisis, the markets had really taken a beating for a few years uh, and it just wore me down. So I needed to do something different. Uh, I became an entrepreneur. I started a few companies. I grew those companies, uh, raised money from investors to you know grow them even more. And last year, I was running a company called Soundguard that was going you know things were going pretty well. And then the pandemic hit and really wiped out the business, uh, destroyed our pipeline. Uh, you know, in terms of our our upcoming projects, everything kind of disappeared as these hotels put all their projects on hold. So then I kind of came back to the investment markets uh, or in the investment industry. And I've, you know, since jumped in uh, with both feet. And now I am um, obviously running my own portfolio. I'm also running a fund for a company called uh, Social Capital based in, Cal uh, yeah, based in California. So uh, a guy named Chamath, uh, he was an early employee at Facebook. He started Social Capital. They do a lot of uh, venture capital investing and some other stuff. I believe they're actually set up as a family office. And then about four months ago, he decided to put together this emerging managers fund program. And they took about 1600 applicants and picked 10 people to manage their own fund. And I was one of those 10 people. So I also do that. And then as you can see from the screen you're looking at right now, uh, I also run a Substack newsletter, which is my weekly stock write-ups. I run a stock twitch room, which is where I post a lot of my daily market commentary and my trades. And then I do a lot of CEO interviews and whatnot and webinars, which I post on my YouTube channel. So, so that's a little background on me. So I'm definitely a full-time investor right now. This is my profession. But in terms of this webinar, I'm going to try to really go back and start at the basics. And, you know, my thinking here is we start at the basics. Uh, I hope there's a lot of people on here that are new to investing. Um, maybe they've started investing in 2020, and but they've realized that they don't really know what they're doing, or there's a lot of terms they don't understand. They've made a lot of mistakes. Maybe they got lucky on some trades, but they do feel like they need to be better educated. And I hope I can do that for you. I also hope there's some people listening to this or watching this later that have never been an investor before, and they've never bought a stock before, and they're looking at starting, 
and hopefully I can help you get started in the right way. Because I think last year was a crazy year in the markets. Um, and I think a lot of people have formed bad habits or their expectations have gotten too high. You know, I was up 250% last year, which is not normal. Uh, typically, you know, historical returns are, you know, at least for the major indexes, are in the high single digits and low double digits. I mean, I know that's hard to believe for people that are new in investing that have seen stocks go up so much in the last year or two. But historically, I mean, if you can, if you buy an index fund or a mutual fund and you average 10, 12% a year, that's considered pretty good, uh, especially in a low rate environment where, you know, your alternative is putting money in the bank and letting it earn no interest. You know, if you can earn 10, 12% a year, you're obviously doing a lot better than sitting in cash. But when you look at 2020 and what happened, uh, that that is not going to be repeated anytime soon, maybe ever in our lifetime. So I just think there's a lot of people that started investing last year that uh, don't really understand what it takes to be a good long-term investor. And they don't really, they don't know what a bad market looks like. And We'll see. We'll, we'll cover some of that. But what I can do is I want to try to provide the basics and then we'll do another webinar maybe in a month or two. Uh, that'll be more for intermediates. You know, where we can talk about more uh, advanced uh, investment strategies, trading charts, uh, stuff like that. I mean, we'll 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 I want to go into some of that towards the end of this. So we're going to go through these slides. Uh, these are not the fanciest slides in the world. I am not the best person at putting slides together. I've also had a crazy couple of weeks, but I did postpone this a couple of times. So I wanted to, you know, get it done and then we can move on to the next one or I can redo this one and make these slides better. We'll see. Um, okay. But so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through these slides. I'm gonna try to provide as much information as I can without kind of overwhelming you without going too fast. And then when we get to the end, um, I'll stop with the slides, I'll share my screen, and then I can go into some charts. We can look at some, uh, stock fundamentals, financials, and I can start to kind of show you what I do, uh, you know, on a daily basis in terms of managing my own portfolio, doing stock screeners, you know, trying to find stocks that I can own, that I could get excited about, and how do I value those companies? Because I think that is important. I mean, you can, you can read all the books you want, you can, you know, watch all these webinars, but until you actually start doing it yourself, it's completely different. Here we go. Okay, so what is investing? So I'm sure if you ask 10 people, they probably give you 10 different definitions. Um, this is kind of how I look at it. When you start investing, you are committing your time, effort, and money with the hope of generating higher returns than what you would get by staying in cash. So like I just said 30 seconds ago, you know, the most basic form of investing, if you want to call it that, is just to have your money in a checking or savings account or a money market account where you're basically earning nothing. So obviously there are better ways to, uh, you know, make your money work for you, as they say, uh, and that would, you know, that involves investing, taking some risk. So now why you should invest. So inflation, uh, I'm not going to get into the, you know, too much macro economic stuff, but so inflation is basically the cost of goods and those goods getting more expensive over time. So that's been one of the, the big debates recently uh, amongst investors is what is inflation going to look like this year, next year, and in the coming years as um, you know, the economy rebounds after the pandemic, as all of this cash that's been injected into our markets uh, begins to flow through the markets. And sometimes when you have too much capital sloshing around, it can create inflation. Um, but one way to beat inflation is to be invested in stocks and to own equities, because over the long term, those stocks are going to, you know, like I said earlier, you know, maybe double digit returns, maybe a little bit higher, maybe a little bit lower. But if inflation averages, let's say two to 4% a year, and 4% would actually be on the high side. You know, the Federal Reserve is looking um, at about 2% a year. That's kind of their, their goal, their mandate, is to try to keep inflation at about 2% a year, which is healthy. I mean, you do want companies to have some pricing power with their products and services. You don't want the opposite, which would be deflation, where they have no pricing power. That, that typically leads to a 
you know, a very bad recession. So you do want to have some inflation. Healthy inflation is probably one, 2%. Um, but if you keep your money in savings, a savings account, uh, you're typically not going to beat inflation, especially right now where, you know, your money in a savings account is earning close to zero. If we get into a period over the next year or two where inflation is two or 3%, you know, you're essentially your, your cash, your savings is being eroded by that inflation. So investing in stocks is one way to beat inflation. Not the only reason, but it's a good reason. Um, you know, we'll talk about, let me go to the next slide here. So actually, I want to skip around. Yeah, okay. So I'll do this one and then go back. I should have had them in the other order. So why should you be investing, right? So for me, uh, I'm 40 years old. You know, I'm investing for a couple of different reasons, but primarily let's call it retirement. So, you know, average, average retirement age is probably 65, although I think recently that's probably gone up, but let's just call it 65. So right now I'm investing so that I can retire at 65, you know, 25 years away from now. So if I, you know, figure out what my annual expenses might be in 25 years, and I'm not going to do that on this webinar, but this is typically what you would do if you were sitting down with a financial advisor. You know, they would ask you, you know, when you retire in 25 years, you know, let's assume your mortgage is paid off. You know, so what are your living expenses, your food expenses, travel expenses, you add it all up and then you divide typically by like 5%, 6%, um, you know, which they, which they say is a healthy distribution amount. So, you know, let's say you need $150,000 a year to live in retirement between you and your spouse, assuming that your mortgage is paid off and you don't have any other debt, you know, divide that by 0 0.05 or 0 0.06. And that would give you a rough idea of what you need to have saved up by the time you retire in order to live comfortably and not be stressed about running out of money in retirement. Now, obviously, the less money that you take out in distributions, you know, the longer your money will last. Um, so I, I think some people are, are saying nowadays, um, especially with interest rates so low, that, you know, that rate should actually be closer to 3% or 4% a year. But that's probably for another presentation because I think that's more that's more geared towards older people that are probably closer to retirement age. You know, if we're talking about investing for beginners, um, I don't I don't know how many people in their teens are actually thinking about retirement yet. It, it feels like a long ways away. Um, I almost think when you're in your teens, it's 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 so hard to invest for what may or may not happen in thirty or forty years. I just think when you're in your teens, you just need to start investing. And one reason I say that is because, and this is going to be hard to explain, but I was explaining to someone yesterday, so let me try to do it again. When you invest or when you buy something, so let's say you want to buy something for $1,000 and you take $1,000 out of your savings account or out of your investment account to buy something. Let's just say it's a bike. Um that bike is not really costing you $1,000. That bike is actually costing you the $1,000 plus whatever that $1,000 would have turned into over the next 10, 20, 30 years as you invested it. And I know that's really hard to think about. Um, I try to do it for myself, although you can drive yourself crazy. You know, if I'm going to take a vacation, right, and that vacation is going to cost me $3,000. It's costing me $3,000 now, but if that $3,000 is coming out of my investment account and those investments would have returned 10, 12, 15% a year, then that vacation is actually, actually costing me way more than $3,000. But you know, I'm not saying that you shouldn't take a vacation for that reason, but I think when you start investing and you start to see the power of compounding returns, and that's what we call it, the compounding returns, as your money grows over time, right? So as your money grows from $1,000 to $1,500 to $2,000, you know, if, you, if, you're, if, you're, if you're gaining or, you know, averaging 10% a year, every year, and I know it doesn't go exactly straight up, but every year you're starting with a higher base. So you're compounding off of that higher base. And that's, that's kind of what the, the power of compounding returns means. Um, but if you think about the, the power of compounding returns, the earlier you start, the better. Um, if you start at, 
you know, 20 years old and start putting, you know, just a hundred, 200, 300 hours a month away. And I know when you're 20, that's probably a lot. Let's, so let's say a hundred hours a month, you know, and you do that for three, four years while you're in college and then you get out of college, you start a job. Now maybe you can put away 200 or 300 hours a month. You know, you start to compound that money from an early age and you get a five or 10 year head start versus that person that starts in their thirties it's insane. And there's actually a chart coming up that shows the difference as you, you know, the earlier you start those having that extra five, 10, 15 years to compound returns makes a monumental difference in the long run. So this is just a chart that shows, you know, why people invest. And, you know, obviously everyone has a different reason. Um, you know, why don't people invest? And, you know, if I asked some of my friends that are in their 30s and 40s why they don't invest, I'm assuming some of them would probably fall into one of these categories. I think a lot of them, the, the, the one that I've heard the most often is uh, I don't know where to start. You know, I never learned how to be an investor. I never learned, um, you know, what stocks were. So I'm just intimidated or I'm afraid to lose money. And unfortunately, when it comes to retail investors, and that's kind of what we call ourselves, retail investors, they tend to invest at the wrong time. So they tend to get too emotional when it comes to investing and they jump into the markets when things look really good. And then when things look really bad, they tend to panic and then they sell. And that's the exact opposite of how you should actually be investing. You know, not that I ever endorse trying to time the markets, but if you were going to time the markets, the right time to get in is actually when things look bad. And the right time to get out is when things look good. And I know that's kind of, you know, counterintuitive to how people think about stuff in, you know, the rest of their lives. But when it comes to investing, the idea is to buy low and sell high. And typically stocks are lower when things look worse, when there's fears out there, you know, uncertainty. That's when stocks are lower because people have been selling them. And then stocks go higher as things get better. And then, you, you know, so that's where you get kind of these, you know, the, the peaks in the valleys of the market or the roller coaster. You know, I call them, you know, the yeah, peaks and valleys. Uh, the terminology that, I, that we throw around on Twitter is, you know, sell the rips and buy the dips. And if you ever hear someone say that, what it means is, you know, it's kind of buying low and selling high. When things look really good and stocks are higher, that's when you might want to be selling some and, and trimming and taking some profits. And then when things look really bad and your stocks have, have pulled back or come down, that's when you want to start buying them back. So, you know, when someone says they are uh, selling the rips and buying the dips, that's, that's what it means. Now, that's not the right investment strategy for everybody. Um, I try to consider myself to be a long-term investor. Now, that doesn't mean that I might, I might buy a stock in January because I really like it and I think I'm going to own it for the next two or three years. But then things change. You know, the economy changes, the market changes, the fundamentals of the company change. And now I feel differently about that company. And maybe I think it's overvalued, or maybe I just think that the market isn't seeing something and may not see something for a while. And in that case, it might just be kind of, a, you know, what I say, what I call dead money for now. So in that instance, and this has happened multiple times this year, I might love a stock in January. I might sell that stock in February. And there's nothing wrong with that. You should never feel obligated to own your stocks. You should never uh, be married to your stocks. So I like to say that I'm, I'm never married to my stocks. I'm only dating them, which means that at any point something could change and I need to sell that stock for a reason and I shouldn't feel bad about it. You know, and sometimes you're going to take a gain on that, on that position, meaning that you have a profit and sometimes you're going to take a loss uh, and that's all right. That happens. You can't win. You know, you can't, you can't make money on, on every single stock. Um, so what would it take to get into investing? So professional help, uh, hopefully I can do a little bit of that for you tonight. Uh, cutting down discretionary spending, which means that you would have more money to invest, uh, obtain more investment knowledge. So I think you know we are in an interesting time where knowledge is more available than ever before, and it's also more free than ever before. So whether that is just through Google or you know, online resources like Investopedia or Motley Fool. I mean, there are tons of resources out there that can help you become a better investor. There are podcasts, there are books, there are endless numbers of blogs, so many blogs. I mean, I have a newsletter 
thousands of other people uh, that understand investing have newsletters. My, mine cost $10 a month. Other people might charge more or less. But And then you have Twitter. And I think Twitter is a very undervalued resource. I, I think obviously most recently it's becoming uh, more valuable. I think more people are realizing that there are there's a lot of content on Twitter, a lot of smart investors that are trying to share their knowledge and expertise with others. So if you are interested in becoming a better investor, I encourage you to get on Twitter and follow some of the bigger investors that really know what they're talking about. You know, I wouldn't recommend copying them or trying to do everything they say. You need to make your own decisions. You need to understand what you own and how to build a portfolio and manage risk. But there are a lot of people on Twitter that can probably provide some valuable guidance for you as you look to become a better investor. So what are some investing myths? So I'm too young to plan for retirement. Um, you know, when I was managing money well, at Morgan State I spent Barney, you know, my average client was probably in their 40s and 50s, but I loved working with younger clients. I loved helping a 23 or 24 year old think about, you know, their retirement someday and what were the steps they needed to take now to put themselves in a better position, uh, you know, to someday retire with enough money. Um, as you can see here, right in the middle, the best way to make money is investing in what is hot. So I would not recommend that. Um, I think when I alluded earlier to these meme stocks and Momo stocks, that's what I was referring to. There are too many investors out there that are chasing these hot stocks. Um, you know, the Reddit stocks, whether this was GameStop or can't even remember what the other AMC. I mean, you know, every year there are plenty of these stocks that just seem to go up every single day. And at some point, you just, you just want to jump in and ride that wave. Unfortunately, a lot of times that ends in uh, losses, right? You know, by the time you finally get in, uh, that stock may have peaked, and now you are you know, riding it down uh, and losing a significant amount of money. So you know, once again, that's why it's just important to become a good investor. You need to understand what you own. You need to know how to manage risk in your portfolio, which typically means you need to be diversified, not just by number of positions, but also by sector. Because if you are all tech stocks and tech, you know, tech stocks are out of favor, then your entire portfolio might be going down at the same time. Um, now, I could also say the same thing about other types of investment styles, which we'll talk about later, which is value versus growth. You know, sometimes those move very similar to one another, meaning if your entire portfolio is all value or all growth, that they're going to trade together. So if growth is out of favor, like it was the last couple of days, all of your stocks might be down while the value stocks are going up. So, you know, that's why it's important to just be diversified, have some balance. Uh, it'll keep you, um, you know, keep your anxiety levels a little bit lower and your stress levels a little bit lower. But you know, we're all different. Some of us are more willing to take risk in our portfolios, uh, more risk than others might take. So um, I think that's enough for that slide. Okay, so let's talk about time horizons. So I think this is important. And when I used to sit down with clients, this was always one of the first questions that we would ask is, you know, what is this money gonna be used for? When is it gonna be used? You know, what's your time horizon? Um, is this money, and when I say this money, this might be $100, $1,000, a $1 million, it could be any amount, whatever amount you are thinking about investing for yourself. You know, is this money that you need to use for something in the next three months, three years, uh, three decades? You know, because that really determines uh, what types of investments are appropriate for you and how much risk you should be taking in your portfolio. So cash, right? And I think this is way too conservative, but for some people, they might feel comfortable um, having three years of, of, of kind of necessity or you know, living expenses in cash. So let's just say your annual living expenses are $20,000 a year, and that includes your rent, your food, your car payment, et cetera. Then some people might wanna have three years of living expenses in cash. I don't. You know, I, 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 think that's an, I think that's a little crazy. That's a little too conservative for me. But, you know, for me personally, because we'll talk about, you know, equities or stocks, mutual funds, bonds, all the stuff we're going to talk about later, 
it's all very liquid. Now, it doesn't mean that it can't lose value in the short term, but it's very liquid. You know, if you put money into a uh, Robinhood account, TD Ameritrade account, uh, Interactive Brokers account, um, any of these other investment platforms, or you hire a financial advisor, whatever it might be, and if you need, you know, to access that capital, typically it's available within two, three, four business days because you can just go into the account, you can sell it, and then as soon as that cash is available, you can you know, use your debit card against it. You can transfer it back into your savings account. You know, money is very easy to move around nowadays. So, you know, it, I, I just, you know, we're not, when you're investing in stocks and mutual funds and ETFs, you're, you're not locking your money up for a long period of time. You're taking a risk with it, but you're not locking it up. And I think there's a, there, that difference needs to be understood. So even though I put this chart in here, um, <laughs> I think it looks cool. I don't necessarily know if it's sensible. Um, you know, as it says on uh, the right hand side, so equity. So if your time frame is at least five years, once again, I think that's really conservative. Um, I would say, you know, if I had to use like a general rule of thumb, my rule of thumb would be um, six, three to six months of living expenses in cash. And then I think everything above and beyond that, you can invest. Now, if you're going to buy a house, you know, let's say you have $20,000 to invest and that $20,000 is going to be going towards a down payment on a home. And you think you're going to buy that home in two years. You may not want to put 100% of that 20,000 into the most aggressive stocks that you can possibly find that would probably not be appropriate since you know that you need that $20,000 for a down payment, but you could probably put a significant portion of it in stocks, but maybe not go for the most aggressive stocks. You know, maybe you'll be a little bit more conservative in your stocks, or maybe put 75% in stocks and 25% in bonds. And I guess as I, well, I think one of the next slides, we'll talk about what exactly are bonds and what are stocks like the, the real definitions of them, because I know I'm throwing around a lot of terms that might be confusing to someone, but my apologies. I know it's it's hard to do these because you really don't know who you're talking to. And, you know, everyone's um, knowledge base is different when it comes to investing. You know, some people might have a portfolio of stocks, but yet still feel like they don't really know what they're doing. Other people might be, you know, 15 years old and never bought a stock before and really not even sure what a stock is. So um, my apologies. Here's the slide I wanted to do. I might've forgotten to put it in here. Okay, I might've forgotten to put it in. So let me just kind of explain. So I think we all know what cash is, right? Cash, money markets, that's going to sit in the savings account and earn interest at close to zero. Bonds are, so bonds are, technically debt instruments that you buy that, so this means that you're buying debt from a company. So let's say I am, uh, what's a company? Uh, Walmart. And, you know, I'm Walmart and uh, interest rates are really low. So I know that I can issue debt or bonds really cheap that, you know, there's a high demand for them. And I want to you know, grow, you know, I'm, I'm looking to build 10 more distribution centers and each distribution center is going to cost a hundred million dollars. So I need a billion dollars. I need to borrow a billion dollars to build these 10 distribution centers. Um, you know, what Walmart can do is they can issue bonds and use that, the proceeds from those bonds to then go build those 10 distribution centers. And the the profits or the income, the revenues generated by having those extra, those 10 distribution centers would help pay back the interest on the bonds and then eventually the principal as well. So that's kind of how it works. So when you buy a bond, you're buying a debt instrument or an obligation from an entity. Typically it's a company, you know, a, a, a Target, a Walmart, an Apple, right? Companies that you would know. Um, but you, there's also government bonds, there's municipal bonds. So, I mean, there's other forms of bonds. And then there's different investment grade qualities and there's taxable and non-taxable. So for instance, you know, government bonds are, are known to be the safest because they're backed by the full faith and credit of the US government. 
but because they're the safest, they're also typically going to have the lowest interest rate. So, you know, right now the 10 year treasury is around one and a half percent. So, you know, that's an option for you as an investor. You can buy a 10 year treasury, 10, 10 year treasury bond, and know that you're going to, you know, your principal is essentially safe. Uh, meaning if you hold that bond for the next 10 years, you will get back your principal, plus you'll be earning interest along the way. However, when it comes to bonds, what happens is as interest rates go up, the value of your bond goes down. So if you buy a bond at 100 uh, with, let's just say, a 2% yield and yield, you know, interest rates are going up. Um, as inflation goes up, as the Federal Reserve raises rates, right? It's all sort of connected. And let's say, you know, now that company, um, let's just say it's Walmart again, uh, has to issue another billion dollars of bonds, but now they're issuing bonds at 3%. Well, now your 2% bond is not as valuable because it has a lower yield. So the price of the bond goes down in order to bring the yield up to 3%, if that makes sense. I know it's confusing, but that's sort of how bonds work. Um, so we're not gonna spend a lot of time talking about bonds because I think if the people watching this are typically on the younger side, um, you're probably not interested in bonds and you shouldn't be because they're traditionally conservative investments that are not great for you know, building wealth over the long term or saving for retirement over the next 20, 30, 40 years. You're gonna wanna own stocks, but I did wanna, at least explain what bonds are. And then equities, which can also be considered stocks or called stocks, that means that you own a piece of a company, right? So it could be Tesla, Walmart, Apple, Amazon, thousands and thousands of publicly traded companies, meaning they trade on one of the US stock exchanges like the NASDAQ or the, um, the New York Stock Exchange. And you can buy shares in that company, which means you own a piece of that company. So you benefit in different ways by being a shareholder or owning stock. Uh, you know, the, the major, the number one way is you hope that the stock price goes up, right? If you buy a hundred shares of a stock that's at a hundred and that price goes up to 150, you've made $50 per share in profit, you know, times a hundred shares is, that was your profit. Um, but of course, stock prices can go down as well. Um, the other way you benefit as a shareholder or owning stock is if that, company decides to pay you a dividend. So what happens over time is as companies become more mature and they generate profits or earnings, uh, they can either retain those earnings on their balance sheet and potentially reinvest them in you know, growth or you know, more hiring, product development, sales and marketing, international expansion, uh, lots of different things or they can use that cash and start to return it to shareholders in the form of stock buybacks, which decrease the float of shares outstanding, which should increase the earnings per share, right? If a company earns a billion dollars in profits and they have a billion shares outstanding and they buy back some of those shares, you know, let's just say they bought back hundred million shares. So now they only have 900 million shares outstanding. Well, if they're still earning a billion dollars, but you divide it by 900 million shares instead of a billion shares, they've technically increased the earnings per share by decreasing the flow. If that makes sense. Uh, the other way is dividends. So companies can also return capital to shareholders in the form of dividends, which means they are paying you uh, based on the number of shares you own. So you know, average dividend yield across you know, the entire S&P 500 is probably around 2%. I could be a little bit off by that, but you know, this is, you're more, like I said, the, the more mature companies, um, banks are pretty well known for paying dividends, uh, energy companies, real estate investment trusts. Um, what else? I mean, there are some of your larger technology companies like Apple and Microsoft pay very small dividends. Uh, other cyclical companies like materials, uh, material companies, they probably pay some decent dividends. So, you know, I'm not a dividend investor. I don't really follow too many dividend paying stocks. It's just not my investment strategy, but there are a lot of people out there that love dividend stocks um, because, you know, if you are a more conservative investor, um, 
or you're living off of a fixed income, meaning, you know, say you are retired and, you know, let's just say you're 65, 70 years old, you've saved up a million dollars and you want to keep up with inflation and you want to be able to, you know, keep taking your three, four, five, six percent distribution every year, but you don't want to keep whittling down, you know, the value of your account, your principal. So a good way to keep up with inflation and, you know, be able to grow your account slowly is to invest in dividend paying stocks. Uh, and that way you can, um, you know, the, the stock appreciation would be able to keep up with inflation, hopefully more than that, assuming that the company is growing revenues or earnings by, you know, high single digits, low double digits. And then you could use that dividend as sort of your income. So I actually know some people that do that, right? Rather than, you know, live off the interest in your uh, savings account, which is close to nothing, you know, why not buy some bank stocks or energy stocks or other types of stocks that pay a three, four, five, six percent dividend and be able to live off that dividend yield without touching the principal uh, of your portfolio. So, okay. So in terms of, whoops. So I actually messed up the heading. So this was, <laughs> Actually, no, I guess it is. This is the right one. So, what's your risk tolerance? So, if you're going to talk risk tolerance, the next couple of slides we're going to we're going to go more into risk, um, which we have talked a little bit about already. But um, so, on the very conservative side over here, right, you have the cash, uh, money market, savings, etc. In the middle, bonds, and then over here, which is what we're going to mostly talk about going forward, your small, medium, and large cap stocks, U.S. foreign stocks, oil, gold, grains which we're really not gonna talk about. That's what we call commodities. And then REITs, uh, so REIT stands for Real Estate Investment Trust. So it's a little complicated, but this is a, it's a special type of structure, tax structure, I guess you could call it, where real estate investment trusts typically own some sort of a hard asset like real estate or oil and gas pipelines malls, shopping centers, apartment buildings, you know, hotels, those, sort, those sorts of things. And they use this REIT structure to distribute the profits um, as income or dividends to the shareholders. And I believe it's still like a 90% pass through. So once again, people that are a little bit more conservative or living on fixed incomes, you know, having some REITs in your portfolio would provide you some uh, some appreciation potential, but also some, you know, some income that would be significantly higher than what you would get in cash. And at this point, probably even much higher than you would get in uh, bonds, uh, short-term treasuries, that sort of thing. But so in terms of risk tolerance, right, if you are on the younger side, you know, teens, 20s, 30s, and you are looking to you know, you know, grow this account for the next 10, 20, 30 years, uh, you know, build wealth for retirement. Um, you should be focused on this, this section over here, equities, uh, you know, small, mid cap, large cap stocks, uh, US foreign, et cetera. Okay, a couple more things I just wanna cover before we start getting into, you know, stocks and research and that sort of thing. So there's different type of, types of accounts that you need to know about. So there's taxable and there's non-taxable. Uh, Non-taxable accounts could all, most of them are considered retirement accounts. So there's IRAs, there's Roth IRAs. Um, IRA stands for Individual Retirement Account. Uh, Roth, I'm not actually sure what Roth. I don't know if Roth stands for anything, but the, the difference, and we'll talk about that on the next slide. So I won't get to it yet. Uh, and then there's taxable accounts. So most people, well, I shouldn't say. Um, Certainly when you're probably starting off, you know, if you do start off in your teens, you're going to have to start with a taxable account because you may not even have enough income to qualify for a non-taxable account or retirement account. But the difference is with the taxable account, you have to pay taxes every year on your gains. So let's just say you have a taxable account, you start off with $1,000, um, you grow that to $2,000 in your first year, and you sell all your stocks, and that means you have a thousand dollar gain, right? The difference between a thousand dollars where you started and you grow to two thousand, so you have a thousand dollar gain. You would have to pay taxes on that thousand dollar gain in a taxable account. In a non taxable account, you would not. So, in a non taxable account, your 
your earnings or your profits are not taxed until you actually withdraw the money. So that means that your portfolio or your account is growing tax deferred for many, many years, which gives you a significant advantage because if you're running a taxable account and you have to keep paying taxes every year, well, that's kind of, you know, like you're, <laughs> like you're taking a chunk of money out of your account every year to pay the taxes. So your account, you know, theoretically your account, if you own the exact same stocks in both and you paid the taxes out of your taxable account, meaning if you owed, you know, $300 in taxes, you actually have to withdraw that $300 from your taxable account. If that's the situation, then the non-taxable account with the same investments should grow or would grow faster and bigger than the taxable account. So there is an advantage, a significant advantage to having a non-taxable account. The disadvantage is you're, you don't have as much liquidity with it. You're not that money is not as accessible to you, meaning if you have to pull the money out before you turn 59 and a half, you actually pay a penalty, uh, typically a 10% penalty. Although because of COVID and some other things, there are some exceptions. Um, I don't follow this stuff too closely. I'm not a financial advisor anymore, but um, I believe that if you pull the money out to uh, as a down payment on a first home, I think it might be uh, that might be an exception, and there's a few others, but I mean, to be honest, I'm not the one to be giving advice on this. Um, I would suggest either you look it up yourself or you talk to an expert, uh, tax accountant, CPA, someone like that, uh, financial advisor that could give you um, better advice than me. But I just wanted everyone to know, I mean, if you are thinking about getting into investing and you hear these terms, taxable or non-taxable, this is the stuff that you need to know about. Um, you know, which account is right for you. I'm not the one to say, I'm just giving you sort of the different options that you might have. Um, you know, right now for me personally, um, all of my money is in a taxable account. I actually closed out my IRAs 10 years ago when I started a business and I wanted to be able to use that money to start the business. And I did have to pay a penalty on it, but, you know, at the time that was just the right decision for me. But generally speaking, you know, once you put that money into a non-taxable account, you, sh you don't want to have to pull it out and pay a penalty. You want to keep that money in there growing tax deferred for you until you're ready to retire. And then once you retire, then you can start pulling that money out. And this is where we get to the difference. So if that money is in, uh, in an IRA, whether it's traditional or Roth, it grows tax deferred, like I said. Now, the difference is the traditional IRA, you're, you're putting, um, when you make a contribution to your traditional IRA, you actually get a tax deduction at that time. But because of that, when you pull the money out, you get taxed on it then. So let's just say you're putting money in when you're 30 and 31 and 32 and so forth, you would get a tax deduction then. But then when you pull it out, when you're 60, 61, 62, then you're paying taxes on your uh, on that money against your ordinary income bracket. Now the difference is the Roth IRA, you don't get the deduct the deduction or deductible upfront, but it comes out tax free. So this is where people try to figure out, and it's I'm not going to get into it, but you know depending on what tax bracket you're in now versus what tax bracket you might be in when you actually start taking the money out. This, the difference between the two might help you decide which type of IRA is appropriate for you. But once again, I'm not a tax advisor or a financial advisor. So, and everyone's situation is different. So if you are thinking about starting a retirement account, um, you know, you need to talk to someone that knows what they're doing that can help you decide whether the traditional IRA or the Roth IRA might be right for you or maybe neither one is right for you and you wanna go with a taxable account. So just information to know. And this is sort of the, the chart that I was talking about before where you can see here, you know, when your money is, is able to grow tax free, right? Or tax deferred for all of these extra years, you're able to, uh, you know, grow that money to something much, much bigger because you're not paying taxes every single year on the gains. Right. So this, you know, over these 30 years in a taxable account, you know, every year, you know, you're buying and selling stocks in that account 
and you're constantly pulling money out to pay taxes on the profits. But in this tax-free account or, or non-taxable account or retirement account, whatever you want to call it, you're not paying tax. Whoops, you're not paying taxes along the way. Celsius break. So I don't know if you guys can tell I'm wearing a trend spider hat and a public sweatshirt. So, so technically they're both sponsors. I didn't take any money from them, um, but both of them sponsored my stock picking contest. So if anyone doesn't, isn't familiar, uh, back in early January, I put together a stock picking contest and put up a website and a form. Actually, let's go to the website real quick. I'll take a little break here. So if you go to fintwitstockcontest.com, you'll see public and trend spider. Um, so if you go to public.com, uh, you'll get to see what they do. So they're sort of a social finance uh, investing app or a social investing app, I guess, where you can build a portfolio and you can let everyone see it, you know, not the amount of money that you have there, but just the sort of stocks that you own. And I think what it does, so it makes investing a little bit more social and fun uh, where you and your friends can kind of, you know, you can own the same stocks or at least you can see what your friends own. So it gives you something to talk about. And maybe you've been looking at a particular company and on public, you can see which of your friends actually own that company. So maybe you can approach them and say, hey, I see that you own Tesla or I see that you own you know, Peloton, what, you know, why did you buy that stock? What, what convinced you that it'd be a good investment? So it gives people a way to kind of break the ice with each other and, and start talking about investing. Uh, Trendspider, which I'll show you guys later, that's where I do all my charts. So if you get into investing and you wanna start looking at the technicals and moving averages and Bollinger Bands and all this other stuff, I highly recommend Trendspider. I use them every single day. And like, I wouldn't, <laughs> I don't, there's a lot of companies that approach me that I don't work with because I, I just don't believe in what they're doing. I don't believe in their product or their service. I do believe in these two companies. Uh, they've been great to work with. I'm very, very friendly with many people at the company. So, and they obviously send me some free stuff too. Um, but back to the stock contest. So, uh, so the first quarter, uh, January, February, March, right, which is Q1, uh, we did a stock contest and I can show you. And this is what it looked like. So 30, about 3,500 people all filled out the form uh, on the website and submitted their three stock picks for Q1. Um, and now what's gonna happen is as we're uh, wrapping up Q1, get ready for Q2, right? So Q2 is March, uh, no, April, May, June. Sorry, it's been a long day. So April, May, June is Q2. What we'll do uh, in a couple of days, actually Friday morning, I will put a new form onto that website, right? So fintwitstockcontest.com. I'll put a new form up probably right around here, um, somewhere in here. And you'll be able to submit your three stock picks for Q2. So, you know, back to Q1. So these, this is the current leaderboard for Q1. Um, as you can see, which drives me crazy, but hey, I mean, this is, this is the game. Um, you know, the people that owned that pick GameStop, um, I think, yeah, basically like the top, well, I don't know. Yeah, the basically the first 15 people or so, 16, 17, 18, geez. So the first 18 people that are leading the contest all have GameStop as one of their stocks. So we'll see. I mean, so I'm guessing one of those people probably win because of GameStop. So there's $6,000 in cash prizes that's up for grabs in Q1. And then we're probably gonna do another six or $7,000 for Q2. Um, I think, I assume Public and Transpire will both be sponsors again. My company, Fintrix, I know will be a sponsor as well. And then there's a couple other companies that I'm talking to that will also be sponsors. So it doesn't cost anything to play. It's totally free to submit your stock picks, but just so everyone knows, if you want to come back on Friday morning to fintwitstockcontest.com, you'll be able to, you know, you'll see a form here. You can submit your three stock picks for Q2, and then we'll put up another, you know, we'll have another spreadsheet just like this 
Um, obviously, you know, everyone's going to have different picks or most people will have different picks. And this, this spreadsheet automatically tracks everything from, you know, the start date until the most recent date. Uh, I believe these, these actually change intraday as well. So over the course of the day, um, we actually track all the prices. So it's, it's pretty much up to date whenever you look at it. Um, so it's just, it's something fun that I put together because I just thought it would, you know, this chart would help give people some new ideas, but it also kind of, you know, investing should be fun. Um, you know, it's, it's investing is stressful at times, especially when you're losing money, but overall you need to figure out how to make it fun um, and exciting and, you know, stay motivated because if you're all of those things, then it gives you the, the, the ability to be patient. And I think that's one thing that a lot of people have a hard time with is patience. You know, they want to make money every day. They hate losing money. And that's when that bad emotional, you know, kind of sentiment kicks in and you start losing money and you get really frustrated and you sell your stocks. And then all of a sudden, you know, things start to rebound, your stocks, the stocks start to go higher. And now you're chasing them higher, paying, you know, maybe paying higher prices than what you would sold at. And that's, that's not the, the cycle that you want to get stuck in. And then Fintrix, I'll just show you that real quick. So this is a website uh, that I developed. So it gives you the ability to look up stocks um, and see price targets based on fundamentals. So I, mean, I started working on this model last April or May, uh, spent about five or six months working on it myself, literally built, built the entire model myself. Um, and this is based on fundamental metrics. So things like revenues, revenue growth, um, EBITDA, um, net income, free cash flow, net cash, net debt, and a bunch of other stuff. That's all part of the model. And what we do is uh, then I started working with a team of developers and we turned that model that I built into a kind of full blown website where you can search for any stock you want. And we pull in all of the data, all of the estimates from analysts, from our data providers, sucks it into the model and spits out a 12 month price target. And what you can do is you can actually click on this assumptions tab and you can see all of the assumptions that we're actually using to come up with this price target. And this is all based on data from our providers. Uh, one of them is IEX, the other is Refinitiv. And what happens is, you know, for, for all of these stocks, thousands of stocks, there are analysts that cover them. And these analysts come up with estimates on, you know, all of these numbers. And then they feed those numbers or submit those numbers to our data providers. And then we, you know, we pay a subscription, a monthly subscription to our data providers to get all of those numbers sent into our website whenever we do what's called an API call. So that's kind of how this all works. And then you can also, you can build a watch list. So you can access your stocks real quickly. You can see the trending list. So these are the 50 most commonly searched stocks on Fintrix over the last 24 hours. So sometimes you might, you know, this is a good place to get ideas, right? So if you are new to investing and you're looking for some new stock ideas, this is a really good place to start because you can see, you know, what are the 50 most popular stocks that other people on Fintrix are looking at, right? And then you can click on any of these green tickers and it'll take you right to um, this page here, right? The price target page. And then you can open up the assumptions. Then you can go back to the trending, you know, click on another one, you know, so forth and so on. So, so I, I built this tool to try to help investors do a better job with their fundamental research and, you know, trying to develop price targets. Okay, back to the presentation. Okay, so investing options, we talked a little bit about this before, right? Commodities, we're not really going to talk about that's like gold, silver, grains, that sort of stuff probably not for most people listening to this webinar. Bonds, you know, these are going to be too conservative for most of you, unless you're much older, closer to retirement. You know, this is what we're going to focus on right here. You know, these are equities, stocks, small cap, mid cap, large cap, and international. So for small cap, I think 
um, I forget where the cutoff is on market capitalization. I think it's around 5 billion. So maybe a little bit lower than that might be 3 billion. So stocks that have a market capitalization under three or 4 billion, let's just call it that, would be considered small cap stocks. Stocks that have a market capitalization of like five to 15 billion, I think it is, would be considered mid cap stocks. And then your large cap stocks would be over 15 billion. So, you know, there's probably a lot of, you know, if I rattled off a bunch of small cap stock names, most people probably wouldn't recognize them because they're not necessarily like household names or brands that you would recognize. Mid cap stocks, probably some of them you would. And then large cap stocks, I'm thinking the majority majority of you would recognize them. You know, this is your, your Amazons, your Alpha, you know, your Googles, your Teslas, GMs, Ford, you know, uh, Caterpillar, right? Target, all those types of stocks, Lululemon, eBay, those are your large cap stocks. So, and it, we'll talk about this later. I mean, this is where you have to try to figure out what kind of an investor you want to be, um, what types of stocks you want to own. Um, larger cap stocks are generally uh, less risky than smaller cap stocks because they're, they're more proven, they're more mature, uh, they typically have better balance sheets, more predictable earnings and cash flow, maybe they pay dividends. So um, I'm, a, you know, I'm a small cap, I'm mostly a small cap investor. I have a couple mid cap and a couple large cap stocks, but primarily I like to focus on the small cap stocks because you know, even though they are a little bit more risky and volatile, um, in most cases, or in some cases, they're growing faster. So they can they can provide better long term returns. But you know, like they're, they're still riskier. So you need to know what you own and why you own it. Um, so this is, you know, kind of just repetitive on what I just said, but, um, you know, the risk of these different asset classes. So, you know, the safest, but also the lowest returns would be money market and cash. And then you kind of move up this, this curve here and you get into bonds and then blue chip stocks or large cap uh, would be right here. And then mid cap, small cap, international and emerging markets. So when you talk about international markets, um, there's what's called developed and undeveloped or emerging. So your international equities, your developed markets would be countries like Germany, UK, um, most of your European countries probably, or at least Western European countries would fit into, you know, this category here. Canada would be in here. Um, Japan, I think, is still in here. And then emerging markets is going to be your kind of your up and coming economies. Um, you know, this would probably be a lot of the African countries, South American countries. I actually think China and India might even be considered emerging markets still, which is kind of crazy since China is the second largest economy in the world, I believe. But, you know, I, I don't know who actually decides when they cross over from emerging to developed, but it is what it is. But just know that, you know, this is this is the risk curve, as they call it. OK, so let's talk about asset classes. So we've talked a little bit about, you know, um, small. So this is what the so you're going to see some abbreviations here. So small cap, you can see my arrow, small cap, EM stands for emerging markets, LG, this is large cap, AA is, actually not sure what A is. What the hell is AA? What is AA? I don't know. <laughs> okay, I'm not even sure what AA is. That is kind of weird. Uh, international, high yield bond, uh, high grade bond. So this is like investment grade, cash and REIT. What would AA be? That is so strange. <clears throat> it might be the average. Average annual? Could be. <laughs> I don't have time right now to average all these out, but if I did, it probably actually would be somewhere around there. So that could be it, might be average. Um, but anyways, the point of this chart, um, you know, you can call this, some people call this the matrix, some people call this the periodic table. It basically shows you that from one year to the next, it's really hard to predict which asset class is going to perform the best and which is going to perform the worst. 
right? I mean, large cap was the best one year, and then it's kind of in the middle. Um, <laughs> it's not it's not good when you see cash at the top. Uh, that doesn't happen very often. You know, cash is hopefully cash is usually at the bottom, right? I think more often than not, it's at least in the the bottom two or three rows. Um, you know, REITs, this was uh, after the housing crisis, the big bounce back in REITs. You know, I would say large, you know, large cap is the orange. So more often than not, it's in the top half. Um, so, you know, this is just a chart to kind of, um, you know, it's easy to find on Google. You can download this and hold on to it. You can't really invest off of this, but it just, once again, it's just a reminder that it's really, really hard to predict which asset class is going to perform the best from year to year. So it's just another just, you know, reminder that you need to be diversified. You, you know, you shouldn't all be, you know, now I might be and other investors might have a, you know, a specific focus or strategy that does that does put them into one asset class or, you know, 80% of their money might be in one specific asset class. But I think for the, you know, general purposes or general education here, especially if you are not doing this full time and you're not going to be watching your investments every day, like I might be or others might be, and you just kind of want to set it and forget it. That's where diversification is really, really important. And that's why you want to have exposure to all of these asset classes, because you just don't know which ones are going to perform the best and which ones are going to perform the worst from year to year. And now there's, there's another one, um, which I don't think I put it in here. Yeah, so here it is. Um, let me just bring this over real quick. So this was another presentation I did uh, three or four months ago. Um, so this is obviously the same looking chart, except it's the sectors instead of asset classes. So if you take the S&P 500, which is the 500 largest companies in the US, right? So the largest is Apple, and then I think it's Microsoft and then Amazon, Google, Facebook, et cetera, um, you know, all the way down to, you know, whatever the 500th largest company is, I think Penn National Gaming or one of those. Um, so if you take the, if you take the S&P 500, which stands for Standard and Poor's, uh, it's broken down into sectors. So financials, technology, healthcare, industrials, et cetera. And this is what that would look like. So once again, same as before, same with the asset classes, it's really hard to predict which sector is going to perform the best and the worst from year to year, right? So let's say 2016, energy did the best. Well, look at energy the next four years. I mean, it did horrible, right? I mean, there's others, you know, you can, um, COND is, I think that's consumer discretionary, you know, right, put up 43% this year, you know, and then it fell back down in the pack. So once again, you know, this is why you not only want to be diversified across asset classes, but you also want to be diversified across sectors. You know, you don't want to have all of your money in energy, all of your money in financials, because what happens if those sectors are the worst performing, you know, and that's where you have all of your money, you're going to get absolutely hammered. So, you know, just like technology, right? Technology did really, really well the last two years, um, but it has not done so well in 2021, right? Because right now we're, all the value stocks are hot, you know, the reopening of the economy. So it's the energy stocks that are doing well, it's the financials, it's the restaurants, it's the um, travel companies, et cetera. That's what's doing well right now while technology has been going down, so. Now, it doesn't mean the technology is not going to rebound. I'm sure it will at some point, but you just want to be diversified. Okay, so let's go on. So best allocation. So this is called the efficient frontier. And it's a little outdated. I tried to find a more current one, but I couldn't. So this only goes through 2017 or the last, was that 30 years, 40 years, 40 years. Um, so as you can see here, this is just, this goes back to the whole risk and return thing, right? Because at the end of the day, if you're going to be investing, that's kind of the two most important things to know is risk and return, right? Um, 
the more you risk, the more you should return. Now, if you're taking um, too much risk and you're not getting enough return for that risk, then you are doing something wrong. So, you know, obviously now this says 8% return for bonds. That's, that might be the historical number. You're not gonna get 8% anytime soon. Cause like we said in the very beginning, as interest rates go up, bond prices go down. So you typically, you usually don't wanna be in bonds when interest rates are going up because you're gonna get crushed on the, the principal. Um, but just based on the last 40 years of numbers, you know, this is what the efficient frontier looks like. So um, this is normally where you would be in here if you were running, like, so if I was still running money at Morgan Stanley or Smith Barney, I would typically be in here for a client, assuming that client was a little bit older and had already, you know, accumulated some wealth and they were looking to preserve that wealth, but still grow, you know, grow their portfolio, grow their account value, keep up with inflation, et cetera. That's where you'd want to be somewhere in here, 70% stocks, 30% bonds, or 60% stocks, 40% bonds. This 50-50 split would be for someone that was probably already retired and really even more risk adverse. Um, and these stocks would probably be, you know, more value conservative stocks, dividend paying stocks, things like that. Now, myself, I'm over here. So I'm 100% stocks in my portfolio because I don't mind a lot of risk because I want a lot of return. And I'm willing to absorb the risk and absorb the volatility and deal with the pullbacks in order to generate, um, you know, above average returns. Now, I don't think everyone needs, you know, not everyone that's young or new to investing needs to be 100% stocks. There's nothing wrong with having a percentage of your money in bonds or cash, although I would argue cash right now might be safer than bonds. Um, but, you know, especially if you're new to investing, you want to hold some cash um, either for pullbacks or, you know, to start new positions or just to kind of sleep better at night you know, give you that, that sense of security or safety. So that's what cash is really good for. You know, if you're a hundred percent invested and a hundred percent in stocks, you're not really giving yourself much room for error. And I think that's where a lot of people are that are new to investing, uh, get themselves in trouble. They, you know, they find some stocks that really excite them and they go all in. And then all of a sudden the stocks go down and they're kind of panicking because they don't have any cash available to buy more of those stocks. Now that they, you know, if you buy a stock at 80 and the stock goes down to 60, well, if you still liked it at 80, you should like it even more at 60, assuming that the, you know, the, the business is still intact, the fundamentals still look good, you know, that the story that you originally liked is still there. You should want to buy more of that stock since it's gone down uh, 20%, 25%, whatever that number is. So, but if you are on the younger side and you have 20, 30, 40 years before you're actually going to use this money for retirement, you know, I would encourage you to be a little bit more aggressive um, and, you know, focus on a, you know, a heavier concentration towards stocks, um, especially if you have money coming in. So that's one reason that I'm willing to be a little bit more aggressive in my portfolio is because I have cash coming in every week to my account. So if the market pulls back, if my stocks pull back, I know that I have cash coming in every couple of days that I can just keep adding to my positions. But once again, if you are in a position where you don't have cash coming in all the time because you're retired, you're out of work, you're in college, whatever it might be. Um, that's where you may not want to be 100% invested at all times. You might want to invest 60%, 70%, 80%, and then keep some cash available. So if your stocks pull back a little bit, then you can add to them. You know, you can lower your cost basis as it's called. So historical returns, and this is why I said in the very beginning that the returns that we saw in 2020 were absolutely bonkers and just so far off from anything that we've ever seen before that I just think people developed an irrational expectation for returns this year and going forward. And investing probably looked a little bit easier than it really is. 
So I wanted to kind of bring some sense of rationality back to, you know, what investors should look to as historical returns. So this is what's, this is, I mean, I know it's hard to believe, but stocks have only averaged about 10% over the last, I think it's 20, 30 years, right? So when you, when you, when you put up a hundred percent, 200 percent in a year, like some people did last year, that's not normal. Um, that's not. Now, do I expect that I can do better than 10 percent a year? Absolutely. Do I think I can do 100 percent every year? No. Um, but I do think I can do 20, 30 percent a year on average, maybe a little bit higher uh, based on the types of stocks that I'm investing in, you know, my discipline, that sort of thing. I do believe that I can you know, beat the indexes by a, a, a large margin. Uh, bonds, once again, this is the historical number over the last 20, 30, 40 years. I would not expect people to see these types of returns in bonds um, over the next few years. I think it'll be very, very hard to make money in bonds over the next few years. And then cash, I think we all know that cash is not at 3% anymore. Uh, it's pretty much close to zero. So, once again, you know, uh, just be mindful that if you're investing in stocks, um, not that you can't have high expectations, but don't expect to see 50, 100% returns every year. And this just, you know, once again, kind of shows you over the last, what is that, 30, 45 years, I think. I don't like doing math on the fly, but yeah, I mean, uh, S&P is obviously this one here. Uh, you can see the S&P 500. Um, outpaced uh, gold and um, government bonds by a wide, wide, wide margin. Now, right here, so this big dip, right? This is the dot-com bubble uh, exploding or imploding. Huge, huge drawdown. I think it was about 50%, maybe a little bit more. I think it was about 50% on the S&P and like 70% on the NASDAQ. And then we rallied into the real estate, you know, through the real estate boom, and then we got this other, this big drop here, which we call the great financial crisis, bottomed out, you know, right around 2008. And then, you know, it's been a pretty insane bull market um, over the last 11, 12 years. Um, and then we, this doesn't even include the, the March 2020 lows, um, but they look something like this. So that, I do remember this, this was late 2019 where we had this big sell-off. And big bounce back. So, I mean, this is kind of what, you know, this is what investing looks like. It's lots of zigs and zags. And I like to say that, you know, the other reason it's good to have a, a diversified portfolio across asset classes and across multiple sectors is because when some of them are zigging, some of them are zagging, right? When your value stocks are going up, your growth stocks might be going down, vice versa. When your technology is going down, your healthcare might be going up. You know, stocks don't always move together in the exact same symmetry. So it's good to have some balance and diversification. Um, and so this was actually the, I think I referenced this much earlier where I said, you know, the earlier you start, the better. So if you look at some numbers here, and this is once again, using that 3% as the cash, which is not realistic, but if you put, I did the math earlier and I believe it was 120,000. So if you invest $250 a month, for 40 years, I believe you've put in $120,000 total. So let's just, you know, even if cash was 1% or 2% over the next 40 years on average, and it's just obviously hard to know, you know, let's just say that it grows to two, 250 at the most, you know, your stocks, assuming that you can get a 10% annual return, you're obviously going to make, right? I mean, the difference you're going to have eight times more money in your stock portfolio than your savings account. So once again, it just, it, and then um, I don't think I actually put the breakdown in here. Like there's actually charts that you can look at that show, you know, if you put in $250 a, uh, a month for 40 years versus 250 a month for 30 years, like the difference is massive. Having that extra 10 years of compounding returns makes such a huge difference in the end. Okay. So I think we kind of laid the foundation. I don't even know what time it is. Oh my God, it's, I've been doing this for an hour. Wow, hold on. Just so everyone knows, this is being recorded and it's gonna be uploaded to my YouTube channel. Uh, so if you do have to jump off early, 
obviously I'm not offended, but you'll be able to watch it on YouTube. I'll probably get it uploaded, uh, probably not tonight, probably tomorrow morning. So the YouTube channel is just to make it easier. I actually directed it, but it's uh, youtube.jonalupton.com. And that'll take you to my YouTube channel and you'll be able to watch this whole thing tomorrow, the next day, as many times as you want forever and ever probably. So everything I do, I know people like to ask me whenever I do webinars and webcasts and interviews, are you going to record it? Yes. The answer is always yes. I record everything. I put everything on YouTube. So you don't, don't feel like you ever have to ask me. It's automatically going to go on YouTube. So I think we've sort of kind of Cash is bad. Now, cash is not bad, but if you're a if you're on the younger side looking to build wealth, um, cash is not going to do you any favors, right? It's just there as a safety blanket. Bonds are not going to do you any good if there's actually a good chance you'll lose money in bonds over the next few years. So let's just assume that we know that stocks is the best alternative for growing your money, um, building wealth, saving for retirement, et cetera. There's a few ways that you can invest in stocks. And I'm going to kind of go through, um, I kind of put ETFs and mutual funds in one bucket, and then stocks are going to be in a separate bucket that we'll get to in a couple of minutes. So ETFs and mutual funds are very, very similar in many, many ways. Although there's so many different forms nowadays of each that there are some differences. So generally mutual funds are like, you're basically pooling your assets with other investors. So the way that mutual funds work, um, and there's, like I said, there's all sorts of mutual funds for different asset classes, different sectors, US, international, small cap, large cap, value growth. I mean, there's thousands of mutual funds, right? And you know, the, I mean, the big companies or the big mutual fund companies that we're most familiar with, like Fidelity and Vanguard and BlackRock, um, they all have hundreds of different mutual funds. But a mutual fund is basically, I say it's pooled assets where there's actually a team of people, um, like a portfolio manager and analysts and traders that are actually making the buy and sell decisions for that mutual fund on a daily basis. So if you put your money into mutual fund, you are entrusting them to make the best decisions for your money. Right. And if, you know, like maybe you want to be, maybe you think large cap growth is going to be, you know, the best place to make money for the next three or four years, then you can go out and find a large cap growth fund and put your money in there. And maybe you think that, you know, small cap value is also a good place to be. Uh, you could put some into a small cap value fund. So you can own as many mutual funds as you want. You know, typically the, I don't know what the minimums are, maybe. $250, $500 each. Um, although if you're using one of these big um, you know, investment platforms like an E-Trade or a TD Ameritrade, they may not even have um, minimums anymore. I'm just not sure. But anyway, so that's kind of mutual funds work. Most of them are actively managed by a team of people, professionals. And you can, you can actually see who these people are. I mean, you can go onto these websites or you can go on to ETF.com. Uh, not ETF.com. Um, I use that for ETFs. Um, so for, for mutual funds, like Morningstar is a pretty well-known. Um, Yahoo Finance might even have mutual fund research. I'm not sure. But Morningstar is definitely the most well-known. So if you're looking to invest in mutual funds, you'd probably want to start at Morningstar. And you can do all sorts of screens. So you can look for, you know, top performing funds that have, a, you know, a... Um, AUM, which stands for uh, assets under management. So maybe an AUM of at least 500 million, but no more than 10 billion. So I typically don't like mutual funds that are too big um, because there's just, it, it limits the fund manager's ability to bet on their best ideas. Meaning if you have too much money to manage, you have to keep adding new positions to your fund in order to have all that money invested. You know, you can't run a concentrated portfolio with too much money. So it sort of dilutes the manager's best ideas, which should, or most likely drags down the performance of the fund. You know, if the fund manager has 10 really good ideas, but they have $10 billion to manage, you know, they can't have all that capital in 10 
just 10 stocks. So they have to keep adding more positions. So now instead of having all of their money in their 10 best ideas, now they have all of that money split, you know, spread across 50 ideas. Um, so even if they're right on the top 10, you know, it, it doesn't have a big enough impact on the overall fund. So, you know, that's an extreme example, but that's sort of what I mean is, you know, you don't want to invest in funds that are too big. Um, it also means that the fund manager has a harder time getting in and out of positions uh, because of liquidity. So, but anyways, I'm kind of digressing here. So mutual funds are actively managed, generally speaking. ETFs are a little bit different, uh, kind of a different structure. So ETFs trade intraday. So you could buy and sell ETFs during the day if you want, although I don't typically recommend it. Um, ETFs are most of the time they're passive. So if you buy an ETF, you are typically buying an ETF that is, you know, like mirroring an index or a sector exactly. So you could buy like the S&P 500 ETF or you could buy the NASDAQ ETF, or you could buy the cybersecurity ETF or the solar ETF, right? So there's so many of these different ETFs now, thousands of them that are, you know, indexes or sectors or some other theme. But recently we've started to see the kind of the explosion of actively managed ETFs. And one of the firms out there that is best known is called ARK Investments which is a firm run by Kathy Wood. So Kathy Wood and ARK became very famous about a year and a half ago when they started making very bullish bets on Tesla. And they put this huge price target on Tesla and everyone laughed at them. CNBC was laughing at them. All the you know, media channels were laughing at them. And lo and behold, it actually came true. You know That bullish price target that they had on Tesla actually came true last year when Tesla went up like 800% or 900% in 2020. So ARK has done really well as tons and tons of money has come flowing into their ETFs. I believe they manage around $60 billion right now, which is pretty insane. Um, and that sort of gets to my earlier point with not investing in mutual funds that are too big. I think ARK Investments is sort of running into this problem right now too, where it was a lot easier to manage those ETFs when they only had a couple billion dollars, but it's a lot harder to manage those ETFs when they have 10, 20, 30 billion dollars, right? It limits how easily you can get in and out of positions. It limits the types of stocks you can own. It also means that your best ideas have a smaller impact on the performance of the ETF. So. So there's, there's little differences to know. Uh, there's more, but I'm not going to go into it too much detail. Um, the other big ones, and I'll, next slide. Um, so like we said, uh, ETFs are traded on the exchange, mutual funds. Uh, if you invest in a mutual fund, you're basically investing at the NAV, which is the net asset value that they price at at the end of every day. Um, so there's no intraday trading with mutual funds. Um, when they say there's like, there is some transparency. I mean, you can you can typically pull up these mutual fund data sheets and see at least the top 10 holdings. Sometimes it's uh, more than that. It really just depends on how much the mutual fund is willing to disclose. Um, expense ratios. So average mutual fund, 0.78%. I actually think most of them are higher than that now. Probably 1% is a better barometer. On ETFs, they're definitely much, much lower. Um, some of the bigger index ETFs are even closer to like 0.1%, which is like $1 for every thousand invested, which is crazy cheap. Um, the actively managed ETFs from ARK, I believe are 65 or 70 basis points. So more expensive than the index ETFs, but cheaper than the actively managed mutual funds. So I know it's kind of confusing. Um, I personally prefer ETFs for all of these reasons, the transparency, the lower expense ratio, the intraday trading. Um, there's also some more creative tax harvesting that they can do. So I prefer ETFs, which is one reason that I'm actually looking to launch my own ETF in the next six to 12 months. Because I think there's a really uh, interesting opportunity for someone like myself with my strategy, um, where I put a lot of time and effort and research into my stocks in my portfolio, 
and more so than what other people are willing to do. And I just think that I've been able to generate returns and prove to others that I can, you know, that I can um, uh, put up superior returns. And in most cases, if, if, <laughs> if I can put up bigger returns than someone else, then why do they want to, you know, spend their time, waste their time and energy trying to do it uh, just to produce lower returns than what I can get them. So, you know, we'll see. Uh, I hope it's something I get a chance to do in the near future. Uh, types of ETFs, I think kind of covered this. Um, the index ETFs, actively managed, industry, sector, commodity. There's inverse ETFs, but honestly, be careful. Um, there's some really risky stuff out there where you can get yourselves in a lot of trouble with these inverse ETFs, with leveraged ETFs, um, you're taking on a lot of extra risk. And if you don't know what you're doing, I don't recommend it. So same thing goes for options. You know, if you really don't know what you're doing with options, just stay away from them. It's an easy way to blow up your account and lose a lot of money. Um, I think people, I think people got lucky with options last year because everything was going up last year in this Fed induced, you know, equity bubble or at least equity boom. And if you were buying options, those call options were making you a lot of money, providing you a lot of leverage. But as soon as those, you know, as soon as the market starts to go sideways or down, those options expire worthless. So all the premiums that you're paying for those options are basically getting flushed down the toilet. So what's a stock? I know we talked about this, but I thought this was kind of a cool slide with all of these logos. So like we said earlier, a stock is basically... Uh, it means that you own shares of a company, a percentage of that company. Obviously, it's a very, very, very small percentage, but it still gives you the rights as any other shareholder. Um, you know, these are just an example of some of the publicly traded companies that you can buy today, right? These logos that we all recognize, Microsoft, Verizon, Pfizer, Coca-Cola, and all of these stocks have a ticker symbol. So, you know, Microsoft is MSFT. Verizon is VZ, T, uh, to Toyota is TM. So all of these stocks trade on um, the US exchanges. Uh, most international people should be able to buy them as well. Um, and all of these companies, you know, what I like about stocks is that you can, you can look at these companies, you can see their earnings, their revenues, profits, dividends, all of that stuff. And you can actually develop valuations for these companies. And you can see where that, where that stock is trading at today. And, you know, if you think if, if based on your research and your models that you believe that the stock is undervalued, then it might present a, an attractive investment opportunity. So if you're buying stocks, um, I kind of put people into two buckets, and I'm sure there's probably 18 more buckets that we could come up with, but these are kind of the two that I like to use. So if you're buying stocks um, because you love the company, the brand, the mission, the products, the services, et cetera, and you believe in that company long-term, then maybe you should be buying individual stocks. And when I say maybe buying individual stocks, I mean, rather than buying ETFs and mutual funds. So let me backtrack, I guess, a couple of steps here, you know, back to my earlier slide where I put the ETFs and mutual funds on one side and stocks on the other. You know, for some people, you should use a combination of both, meaning, you know, let's just say you have $10,000 to invest and maybe you're really new to investing and you want to own stocks, but you're, you know, still kind of lacking the skill and experience to pick your own stocks and build a portfolio. What I would typically re recommend for that person is take 80% of your money and buy mutual funds and ETFs with it. And then you take the other 20% and buy some individual stocks. And that way you start to build the, the experience and the skill necessary to become a better investor and learn how to pick stocks. And when you start to invest in individual stocks, you know, you, you, you're gonna make mistakes, right? I mean, no one's perfect. Um, you will make mistakes. You will pick bad stocks. Your stocks will go down. You will lose some money, but that's how you learn. And you'll become a better investor because of it. But you know, I wouldn't risk all my capital um, in, you know, by, by having all of my money in individual stocks if you're really new to it. So when I say reason one, I mean, you know, if you're new, um, that 20% that's not going into mutual funds and ETFs and you want to start buying individual stocks, then stick, to, you know, one way to do this is stick to the companies that you know best, right? So if let's, 
you know, I don't know how old everyone is, but let's go back 20 years when Amazon was kind of, you know, making their big move. Netflix was transitioning from DVDs to streaming. Apple was coming out with the iPhone. You know, if you became customers of those products and you fell in love with the products and you bought the stocks because of it, you've done really, really well. I think where people get themselves in the most trouble is they buy stocks uh, that they don't really understand or they buy stocks from a company that they don't really understand and they don't really know the products. They've never been a customer. And that's where you kind of start, you know, you're kind of fishing or I just think that's where mistakes get made, especially for younger investors. So, you know, kind of the old, um, uh, who's the famous investor, Peter Lynch, who was a very, very renowned investor at the Fidelity Magellan Fund. You know, that was kind of his number one rule was invest in companies that you can understand. The other reason to buy individual stocks is because you believe that you can outperform the indexes. You know, let's be, let's be honest. If you don't think you can beat the indexes, if you don't think that you can beat the S&P 500, if you don't think you can beat the NASDAQ, if you don't think you can beat the Russell, then why, <laughs> I know this sounds kind of counterintuitive, but why even try? I mean, think about all the time and effort and stress that you're going to put into running your portfolio when in the end, you're not even beating the indexes. At that point, you might as well buy the index for 10 basis points, which is one tenth of a percent, and just track the index or find a fund manager that you really like and you like their style and you think they've had really good performance and buy the mutual fund and, and let them manage your money for you. Now, I mean, I, I do think that's a boring way to invest and I personally don't like it. You know, I'm very competitive at, at heart. So, and I believe in myself and my ability to find great companies. So I prefer to invest in individual stocks, of course, but it doesn't mean that everyone has to. So these are kind of the two buckets, but I know this is sort of a, an arbitrary game because you may, you may fit into one of these or both of them or none of them, but I'm just throwing some ideas out there as to why you may or may not invest in individual stocks versus using like an index ETF or an actively managed mutual fund. Now, you know, back to ARK Investments, I mean, I think there's a lot of people that saw how well ARK did last year and kind of threw their hands up and said, okay, you know what? Like ARK is doing so great. They're investing in all the same companies that I love rather than me spend five, 10, 15 hours a week doing it myself. I'm just going to put my money into ARK's ETFs and spend that extra time doing something else, right? Playing sports, traveling, boating, going to the gym, reading books, taking naps, you know, petting your cat, whatever it might be. So um, just kind of know if you're not going to put in the time and effort and you're not going to do your homework and you're not going to follow these companies, you may not be the right person to invest in individual stocks. And there's nothing wrong with that. But know, kind of know yourself, right? Look at yourself in the mirror and like ask yourself, am I going to put in the necessary time to manage my portfolio the right way. Otherwise, you're just putting your money at risk, right? If you're not gonna do the homework, then why even put your money at risk? Give it to an expert, give it to a professional, let someone else do it for you. So different investment styles. So, I mean, once again, I could spend 10 hours on this slide alone, I'm not going to, but so the three investment styles that I kind of break it down to are value, growth, and GARP. Um, and you, as you can see here, the ticker symbols kind of give you a good idea of what types of stocks would fit into each of these three investment styles. So I'm growth, right? And we'll get to that in a second. So value stocks, Pepsi, Procter & Gamble, Johnson & Johnson, Walmart, Monster, and I'll mention the second why I talked about Monster, Intel, IBM, General Electric. So these are typically slower growth companies. I say zero to 15%. Some of them are actually less than zero, right? So some of these companies um, actually have declining revenues, uh, which would certainly make them a value stock. But most of these companies are, most value stocks in general are slower growth, but they're already profitable, right? If, if, if they're slower growth and they're unprofitable, you'd have a really hard time convincing me of why you'd even want to own them in the first place. 
but at least if they're profitable and they're generating earnings, it gives them some options, you know, in terms of buybacks and dividends. But uh, so value stocks are typically going to have a lower price to earnings multiple. So once again, I mean, there's a couple of ways to figure out PE multiple. Um, you can either take the market cap of the company and divide it by the profits or earnings, or you take the price of the stock and divide it by the earnings per share. And that gives you the price to earnings multiple. Um, usually these stocks, right? So value stocks, profitable, they're going to pay a dividend or and or they're going to be buying back um, shares. And these are companies that are usually more conservative with their decisions. You know, once a company starts to pay a dividend or starts to buy back stock, they're kind of saying to the market, we have this cash and we don't know what else to do with it. We don't want to invest it in growth. So you know what? We're just going to return it to the shareholders. And that works for some people. You know, that is, there's nothing wrong with that necessarily. That's not how I, like, those aren't the types of companies that I want to invest in. I don't think those are the types of companies that generate the highest returns over the long term. But once again, if you're a more conservative investor, more risk adverse, maybe a little bit older, closer to retirement, you've already made some, you know, you've already, you've already accumulated your wealth, um, then you might be a better value manager. These might be the types of stocks that you want to own. Now, growth, actually, you know what? I'll save growth for last. Uh, GARP, which stands for growth at reasonable price. So, you know, here's four companies that would fit into this category, in my opinion. So Amazon, Facebook, NVIDIA, and Apple. So these are companies that are still growing at 15, 30%. Uh, another company that I just, that just reported a couple of days ago or yesterday, Adobe, I put them in there. Um, so there's, I mean, there's, hundreds of companies that you could put into this category called GARP. Uh, you don't really hear anyone talk about GARP um, because I used to work in the investment business. It's a term that we used to throw around, but uh, 15 to 30% growth. That's kind of how I categorize it. Uh, profitable or very close to being profitable. In this case, all of these companies are very profitable. Actually, I should, I should probably I think in order to be GARP, I think you probably have to be profitable. Um, slightly higher price to earnings multiple than value stocks, but a big part of that is because they're also growing faster. They deserve to trade at a higher multiple. It's justified. And they might pay a dividend, but they're also still investing for future growth. Uh, most of the time, these companies are still doing acquisitions. They are still expanding. They are you know, launching new products and services. Um, and they're being aggressive in their, you know, their growth strategy, as you've seen with Amazon, right? I mean, Amazon could have been very, very profitable years ago if they wanted to be, but instead they used their profits to invest in growth by building, you know, more of these warehouses, these distribution centers, building out a logistics network and shipping. Um, sorry, my brother just sent me a text message. Um, same with Facebook, right? I mean, Facebook has really high gross margins, really high operating and net income margins, very profitable, but, you know, they've been growing, you know, they've been doing uh, M&A, which stands for mergers and acquisitions. So they've been acquiring other companies, right? They acquired uh, Instagram, they acquired WhatsApp, they acquired Oculus. So they've been very aggressive in trying to grow. Uh, NVIDIA, same thing with NVIDIA. NVIDIA, um, you know, it's a much higher PE multiple, but they're also growing rapidly. They're doing acquisitions. They're trying to buy, trying to buy a company right now called Arm Holdings. Um, and they've been, you know, they've become kind of the leader in these high performing chips, uh, which go into everything from autonomous cars to data centers. So, and I think we all know Apple pretty well. So value, GARP, and the last one, which I obviously um, am mo most fond of is growth. So this typically means that, you know, these are companies that are growing at at least 30% or more. Um, most of the time, but not always, these are companies that are still founder led, um, focused on taking market share and growing revenues, uh, revenues over profits, right? So even if these companies could be profitable, it's just not their focus. They're really focused on market share and growing revenues, growing as fast as possible. Um, so negative price to earnings multiples, because typically these companies are not profitable or barely profitable. So these are typically companies that you end up valuing on a price to sales multiple instead of price to earnings. And most likely not paying a dividend or buying back shares because they don't have the cash or the balance sheet to do so. 
So these companies, Tesla, Zoom, Peloton, CrowdStrike, Upstart, Futu, and Celsius. So the reason I threw Monster in here and Celsius in here is just to kind of give a quick example. So Celsius is one of my favorite companies, right? I'll hold up the can. I'm drinking one right now. So Celsius is a healthier energy drink company that uses more natural ingredients. Uh, the company is also growing really fast. So last year they grew revenues at 74%. Uh, they're now available in 82,000 stores. They're rolling out or introducing these branded coolers. And there's a lot more stuff going on with the story, but I won't get into it. But, you know, the reason, but, okay, so Celsius is also trading at around 20 times sales. Monster is kind of like the older, more mature Celsius, right? Monster has been around for 20 years. They grew really, really fast for the first 15, 16 years. And now their growth has been slowing down as they become more mature, as more competition has come around. So the reason that I put Monster into the value category is because Monster revenues are now only growing in single digits. So Monster revenues, I believe this year, are projected to grow at like eight or 9%. So let's look at it. So I use ticker um, for all of my financial stuff, estimates, fundamentals. So, okay, so 14, oh, okay. So they drew not, uh, so grew 9.5% last year, expected to go revenues at 14% this year, 10% next year, but I would still consider them a value stock, right? Um, Gross margins are up to 59%. You can see here that, you know, uh, net income margins 27, so they're very profitable. So, I mean, they've changed, you know, where this used to be a high growth company. And if you go all the way back here, you know, you can see some much, much bigger growth years, you know, 15 years ago, right? 73%, 49%. And then you can see, you know, it's obviously trailed off in the last five or six years. Um, oops. so that's when I, you know, that's why I put uh, monster into the value category. You know, they, they were not always a value company. They used to be a growth company. Um, and then they kind of went from growth to GARP and now they've kind of gone from GARP to value. So, um, and then Celsius on the other hand, of course, is growing much, much faster, taking market share. Um, so Celsius is growing at almost 10 times faster than, um, than Monster. And if you look at the recent Nielsen data, they're growing almost 100%. That's, that's their, uh, their bar scan data. Um, Upstar is a company that I love. They just reported earnings last week. Uh, they reported uh, pretty good earnings for 2020, yeah, 2020, but they raised guidance on 2021 to 500 million in revenues, which would be about 115% higher, you know, year over year growth. Um, and this is a company with 80, I think it's 84% gross margins, 46% operating margins, or what they call a uh, contribution profit. Um, so, you know, this, this stock is upstart was up 3x over the last three days, meaning last Thursday, Friday, and Monday. And then it's dropped about 30% over the last two days, maybe 35%. Um, but I own this stock still because the fundamentals are so strong. You know, it's really difficult to find companies growing at over 100% with 84% gross margins and 46% operating margins. And when you find those types of companies as a growth investor, you hold on to them. You, you know, you, you, you have to be, you know, you have to have conviction, right? Because if you're going to, um, if you're going to hold on to a stock and be able to, and be able to, or at least willing to withstand a 25, 30% pullback from time to time, you have to have conviction. And then that conviction is what gives you patience. And because I have conviction and patience, then I'm willing to add more to those positions as cash comes into my account. So that's how I manage money, right? My cash comes in every couple of days. I look around my portfolio. I look at where stocks have been over the last few days which stocks I think have been unfairly sold off or are trading at discounts to their, you know, their real or true valuation and which stocks could have the most upside over the next three to six months. And that's where I put my money. 
So over the last few days, as the market has been selling off growth stocks, you know, Upstart, Futu, Celsius are three of the stocks that I've been adding the most money to, because these are the stocks that I believe in over the next three to six months and longer. So just to kind of show you what diversified portfolios might look like now, you know, I've been a growth investor for a while, but, you know, my style changes, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think if you're going to invest in stocks, you have to be willing to, you know, like I said earlier, you can't marry your stocks, but you also have to be willing to adjust your, your style or your focus. Um, sometimes it's because you just you see a bigger opportunity in something else. Sometimes you think it's the market, you know, the, the market sentiment has changed on a particular style or sector and you need to kind of, you know, change with it. And in 2020, I just felt like, oh, you know, this, this was my portfolio back in October and November. And as you can see, if you know, if you know these types of stocks, Fiverr, Alibaba, Fastly, Twilio, Zoom, Roku, Pinterest, Amazon, Peloton, Teladoc, Etsy, CrowdStrike, Square, DocuSign, C Limited, Facebook, Tesla. This is a very high growth portfolio, primarily large cap stocks, um, all trading. They were all trading at the time at pretty rich valuations, pretty rich price to sales multiples. Um, and they all benefited greatly in 2020, not just from you know, the, the boom in stocks, but also from the pandemic, the shift to, you know, digital everything and, you know, digital payments and online commerce and all of that, right? These, these are the types of companies that benefited greatly um, from all of those, those trends. Um, and that's why I owned them. And that's why I was up 250% last year. But as we got into the end of 2020, I felt like a lot of these stocks had already run their course the valuations had gotten stretched, that all of the good news was already priced in, and that we might start to see either a sell-off or multiple contraction or some of these stocks going sideways for an extended period of time. So that's why in late 2020, I made the decision to start getting out of all of these stocks, taking my gains, uh, and transitioning into a actually even a higher growth portfolio, but, but smaller companies, small caps and mid caps with, you know, extremely high growth rates, uh, very disruptive products and services, creating new categories and industries. And this is what my portfolio looks like today. So completely different, all new stocks, literally there's not a single stock that I owned in late 2020 that I still own. So, and up until recently, my portfolio was actually about twice as big as this. I had about 40 stocks in here and I've trimmed about half of them out in the last few days or last week as the volatility in the growth stocks has, has increased. I've decided to um, trim down my portfolio and constrict the number of holdings to about 20. So essentially these are my, my, 20th, my 20 highest conviction stocks. And as you can see from the percentages, you know, like I said earlier, Upstart is my largest holding, and then Dermtech and Futu and Mohawk and Celsius, um, and then Transmedics. And the reason I like some of these companies, and this is what I kind of want to, you know, emphasize, if you're going to be an investor and you're going to own individual stocks and you're going to do the research and put in the time and effort, um, and but it's, you know, if you're going to invest in stocks, you can't just buy a stock and just let it sit there. You know, I mean, you can. I mean, if you're a really true long-term investor and you think that you're buying a stock and you're willing to hold it for the next three, four, five years, and there's nothing that can make you sell it, then I guess the amount of work that you have to put into it is kind of minimal, right? Because it doesn't really matter what the company does, you know, quarter to quarter, year to year, you're not going to sell it anyway. So maybe you don't need to do your homework. But for most people, including myself, if you're going to own a stock, you're kind of making a commitment to keep doing the research and the due diligence and the homework on that stock to make sure that you should still own it, right? Because if something changes with the business, the story, the fundamentals, management, whatever it might be, maybe you shouldn't own that stock anymore. Maybe something's changed dramatically and that stock is no longer a good investment for you. Um, so I put a lot of time and effort into my positions. I do write-ups, I do all sorts of reports, I build models, 
I listen to the earnings calls. Um, I do interviews with the CEOs. I talk to other investors that are shareholders. Um, I read research reports from analysts. Um, I look at the investor presentations. I look at the SEC filings. So, I mean, there, if you're going to do this the right way, there is a lot of time and effort that can go into it. Now, I don't think everyone needs to do that level of detail. Um, you know, my, my attention to detail is a little bit different than some people. I'm also doing this as a profession. So this is really my, my full-time gig, if you want to call it that. So I owe it to myself as well as uh, the fund that I manage and someday my investors that I should be doing this homework. This is part of my job. But I also really, really love my companies. Like I get really, really excited when I talk about my companies and what they do. Um, like for instance, Dermtech has created these non-invasive um, genomics-based skin patches to help detect um, early skin cancer. And they are going to save a lot of lives with their patches. They're also going to prevent a lot of unnecessary biopsies with their patches. You know, that's a company that I am extremely passionate about. Uh, Transmedics, so TMDX, as you can see down here, Transmedics has created these, what are called OCS machines, which is organ care system. And if you know anything about uh, organ transplant, you know that organs are transported in ice coolers. So if someone dies in one state and that organ is being sent to another state, right, to from donor to recipient, that organ is going to be transported in a ice cooler on a bucket of ice, which is just insane to think about. Transmedics has created these machines that are like the size of a, like a night, like a small nightstand next to your bed. Um, and they can, you know, completely um, self-contained unit that can keep that organ alive uh, and pump it with blood and oxygen and nutrients, and it can be monitored. Um, so the difference is you are keeping that organ alive and healthy and functioning. And it's called, it's with warm perfusion, meaning you're pumping warm blood through it, which is exactly what our bodies are doing versus taking an organ out of a donor, putting it onto ice, transporting it, and hoping that that organ is not dead or unusable by the time it gets to the recipient. So once again, Transmedics is going to save a lot of lives with their, their technology. So, and I could go through all my companies and, and explain why I own them, um, but I'm not going to do that to you. But so I, I just think that's an important part of investing. And that's not something that you're going to get with mutual funds or ETFs. You know, you're not going to get excited about an ETF. You're not going to get excited about a mutual fund. They might be great investments, but it's a different mindset, I think, that goes into it where if you're going to build a portfolio of individual stocks, um, not only do you have to really understand the stocks that you own, but you need to be at least excited about them, I think. At least that's how I look at it. Because if you're not excited, like, are you going to be patient when the stock sells off 10%? Are you going to say, oh, screw it. I'm just going to sell it. Like, I don't need this hassle. Or you can be like, no, I know this company really well. I know the product. I know, you know, their growth strategy. I trust management. Like they just, you know, they just landed a big deal here or there, or they just, you know, I think they're going to get FDA approval. I mean, there's a, there's a million catalysts um, that can push a stock higher. And the better you know that stock, the more conviction you have to hold that stock through the bad times. And every stock has bad times. Every single stock is going to have bad times. And it's what you do in those bad times that makes you a good or a bad investor long term. So I think this is the last slide, and then we'll do some screen sharing, um, go through some charts and stuff. I know it's been two hours. It's insane. Um, okay, so I'm not going to spend. I'm actually not going to spend too much time on this. Um, this will be part of the slide um, that will obviously get the whole thing is going to get uploaded to YouTube. So if you really want to go through and look at this again, you can. But when I'm looking at so when you're doing research on a stock, I mean there's a hundred things that you could look at. It's probably more than that to be honest. Um, everything from you know what are the products and services. What's the business model? You know, what do they charge? How do they make money? 
Um, you know, who's on the management team? What's their experience? Is the company still founder led? Who are the biggest shareholders? How much equity does the management have? Um, you know, how big is the, the, the TAM, right? TAM, total adjustment market. How big is the TAM? Is the TAM growing? Is the TAM shrinking? You know, where does most of the revenue come from? Are they regional? Are they national? Are they global? Who are the big competitors? Um, why are they better or worse than the competitors? Um, you know, are they launching new products? How long does it take them to launch new products? Are those new products being adopted quickly? What are their margins? I mean, I could go on and on and on and on as to all the little things that you could look at into trying to understand a company and get to that point of conviction where you want to own the stock. And some stocks are easier to get to that point than others. I'll admit that, right? Sometimes you aren't always going to get the answers to your questions. Sometimes you sort of have to say, okay, you know what? This, this stock checks off eight of the 10 boxes that matter most to me. The other two boxes are kind of unknowns, right? Maybe it's management, maybe it's the competitive advantage, maybe it's, I'm not sure how they're gonna make money. Um, and you just have to be okay with that risk. And that's where um, that stock might make it in your portfolio, but maybe because it only checks off eight of the 10 boxes, maybe it's a smaller position in your portfolio. So that's where, when I talk about risk management, that's what I mean. You know, risk management is lots of different things. It's not just diversification across sectors and asset classes, but it's also position sizing. So the stocks, at least for me and most people, you know, the stocks that you have the most conviction in, um, those should typically be your biggest position. So those are the stocks that, you know, maybe nine of the boxes are checked off or 10 of the boxes are checked off. You know, then you feel more comfortable having that stock as a bigger position in your portfolio. Doesn't mean you're going to be right. Doesn't mean that you're not going to, you know, it's not going to go down or you're not going to lose money on it. But at least if you've done your homework on that company and you've gotten to a point where you feel comfortable owning that stock as your biggest position, that's how you come to that conclusion. You know, if a stock, you know, so recent, I mean, there's, and there's been a few examples recently of stocks that I've owned where, you know, maybe only six or seven of the boxes were checked, but I really liked the industry. I really liked the products and services. I thought they had a solid business model, but the stock went down and I lost money on it, you know? And sometimes I, you know, I have to go back and, and relook at all the, the numbers and the information and the investor presentations and see if I missed anything. And if I didn't miss anything and I still have conviction in that company, then I should buy more shares because now the stock is cheaper than it was before. But if something has changed and maybe the market realized it before I did, or maybe I was wrong in my earlier calculation, then I should sell that stock because now things have changed. My conviction is lower and maybe now it doesn't belong in my portfolio. So, okay, uh, so that wraps up the slides. I hope that was helpful. Um, where I can start first. Um, so let me just go to, so ticker.com is where I go for all my financial stuff. Um, so ticker.com. So uh, obviously I'm going to sign in. I, so I think they're still running this special where I think there's a wait list, but if you go ticker.com backslash Jonah, um, it'll allow you to sign up right away. And I believe you get access right away. So you skip the wait list. But obviously, I'm not going to do that since I already have an account. Um, so I've just found that this information on Ticker is as good as any other information anywhere else. There's literally a hundred places that you can go to, and most of them are are um, bookmarked here. Um, so Finwiz, Coifin, um, I mean CNBC and Yahoo even have some stuff. Uh, Bloomberg. I mean, there's tons of websites where you can get your your financial data from. But I just I just like Ticker. So uh, let's just go to Upstart. So I'll show you why I'm so bullish on Upstart and, and kind of how I come up with valuations. So, so it's one of the first things I look at at a company is market cap and enterprise value. So market cap is the shares outstanding multiplied by the current stock price. That'll give you the market cap. Enterprise value is market cap plus or minus any cash or debt on the balance sheet. So let's just make this easy and say that 
let's say the market cap was $9 billion and the company had a billion dollars in cash on the balance sheet, then it means the enterprise value would be 8 billion. Now let's say the market cap was 9 billion and they had a billion dollars of debt on the balance sheet. Now the enterprise value is 10 billion, right? So where this is really important, and this is why when you're doing valuations on companies, you really should be using enterprise value because it's a much better representation of the business because it takes the cash and the debt into consideration. If you like, let's look at the airlines. So American Airlines, So, I mean, end of story, example proven, <laughs> where market cap is 14 billion, enterprise value is 48 billion. And that's because the company has been forced to take on an absurd amount of debt. So if you were trying to value the airlines against each other, and one airline had, what was that, $34 billion in debt, and another airline had $8 billion in debt, but you were comparing market cap to market cap, it wouldn't be fair, right? Because American Airlines might look cheaper if you're using market cap to develop the multiple when they have all this extra debt that you should be taking into consideration. So, you know, when I'm building my own models, when I'm doing price to sales multiples and coming up with valuations, I try to always use enterprise value because it includes the cash or the debt on the balance sheet, which is a really important factor. So back to Upstart. Actually, uh, oh no, okay, I didn't show you my portfolio. Um, okay, so estimates. So this is where you can see, you know, previous years, um, you can go quarterly, you can, well, so this, the company just came public uh, recently, so you can't go any farther back, but assuming that this was an older company and they had you know, um, previous years of financial data, you could go back as far as you wanted, I think, or at least in most cases you can. So at least for Upstart, um, so this was the number that they reported. So 233 million was their number for 2020 which was fine, right? 42% year over year growth from the previous year. But where the story really picked up steam um, and why the stock went up 3X in three days was because of this number. So Upstart came out on their earnings call or in their press release and said that revenues for this year are gonna be 500 million. And normally when companies give guidance, they're always gonna um, be on the conservative side. Now, I mean, I could, Assume that it's going to be 505 or 510, 515. I mean, I think any of those numbers would probably be appropriate. But even using even using 500 million, and actually, so let me show you one more thing. Um, so the other one I use besides Upstart, and I like to, I'll show you why, is Yahoo Finance. So Upstart only shows you the consensus number, which is essentially the average of all the estimates. Up, um, Yahoo Finance will show you uh, the consensus as well as the high and the low. So uh, one of the problems though, is that you know, a company like Upstart, which is a recently uh, publicly traded company, they IPO'd in December. There's only three analysts that cover the company, but I'm not too worried since the company already gave their 2021 guidance of 500 million. So we know it's gonna be somewhere in that, in that ballpark, but at least here you can see, so the low estimate is 503, the high estimate is 507. So, Yahoo actually has a consensus of 504. Um, here, consensus is 501. So I'm not sure what the difference is. It's kind of hard to know, but anyways, somewhere around 500 million. So if we know the market uh, enterprise value is 8.5 billion, let me see if that, I don't, that may not have taken today in consideration. Give me two seconds. Upstart. So upstart um, finished the day at 112. So 112 times 73. So 8.2. Looks like they have a little bit of cash on the balance sheet, right? Because enterprise value is lower. So what was that? 150, something like that. So let's just call enterprise value on upstart is 8 billion ballpark. 
So 8 billion divided by, let's use the Yahoo number, 504. So Upstart is trading at under 16 times EV divided by sales. So in order to get that number, right, let me just, you know, let's go through this again real quick. Enterprise value is the market cap minus the cash. Uh, and then you take the enterprise value divided by the consensus estimates for revenues or sales. There's not, those names are kind of interchangeable. So divide 8 billion by 504 and you get 15.8. So that's 15.8 times enterprise value divided by sales. For a company that's expected to grow revenues at 116% and has 84% gross margins and 10% EBITDA margins. So the company actually, it's, it's strange. There's most companies report um, gross margins, EBITDA margins, then income margins, um, Upstart actually reports uh, contribution profit margins. So it's like somewhere in between the two. I'm still not 100% sure what goes into contribution profit margins since very few companies actually report it that way. I did talk to investor relations at Upstart and they basically said it's the gross margin, but it has all the expenses basically baked in, um, you know, sales and marketing, et cetera. So it sounds like it's kind of operating margins, but I'm surprised that it's not closer to the EBITDA margin in that case. So a little confusing, but so in this case, it's just, you know, you can use the 84, you can use the 46 that they, that they talk about as contribution margin. Either way, um, Upstart has phenomenal fundamentals, right? I mean, we're talking a company growing at 114 to 116%. That's already profitable with really great gross margins. They just announced that they're acquiring a company called Prodigy, which is gonna get them into the auto loan business, right? So right now, all they've been doing is personal loans. So what Upstart is, is they're an AI powered underwriting platform. So they developed this phenomenal, uh, complex AI underwriting model that has 1600 data points that allows their partner banks to do a more accurate, uh, and risk adverse kind of underwriting process. So within seconds, they can evaluate anyone's creditworthiness with these 1600 data points rather than the traditional FICO score, which is outdated and 30 years archaic. So Upstart clearly has a better model for underwriting and the banks are able to, I believe it's issue around twice as many loans without increasing their, uh, their default rates. And that's important, right? Because banks are in the business of lending and making money. So if you can keep your default rate at, let's say, 5%, but you can issue twice as many loans, then that means you can essentially generate twice as much revenue. Uh, and that's what Upstart's able to do for all of these banks. And, you know, there's thousands of banks around the country and the small banks are trying to compete with the big banks and the big banks have all these resources and the small banks don't. And Upstart is giving those smaller banks, you know, whether it's community banks or credit unions uh, as a, a way to have a, a kind of a technology edge on the bigger banks with this better platform. And so this $500 million in revenue that they're projecting for this year is just off of the consumer loans that they've been doing. And now they're getting into auto loans. And I interviewed the CEO last week and it sounds like that's just the beginning that after this, they wanna do uh, small business loans, credit cards, you know, basically any type of lending or credit that assesses the individual's credit worthiness, that's where they can make an impact. So. This is the type of company that really gets me excited as a growth investor. When I find a company like this, I'm salivating over it. And I want to own this stock for many, many, many years because even though the market cap right now is only $8 billion, you know, I've built models that show that this could easily be a $30, $40 billion company in four, five, six years. So you know, when the stock pulls back, and I'll show you the charts now. So... I started buying Upstart. I actually did a write-up on Upstart back in late December when the stock was in the 30s and 40s. And then the stock, you know, trended higher through the first two months of the year, got up to about right here, 105, and then came crashing down. And this was 
very, very painful because I didn't sell any shares up here. Now, I didn't know that the stock was going to pull back 50%, right? I had no way of knowing that. Um, but as you can see here, what's happened is obviously this was the day that they reported those earnings. They guided higher and the stock went bananas. I've never seen a stock do this. I mean, at least not a stock that I owned, you know, not a you know, decent sized company. I mean, penny stocks will do this kind of stuff, but not, you know, what was a $5 billion company at the time that just went absolutely parabolic. I mean, these three days were just crazy. But, you know, what happens at that point is, you know, the stock hits 160 something and everybody starts selling at the same time to lock in their profits. And, you know, the stock pulled back today to 112. Now, obviously, if you owned the stock here, you know, at 56 or 60, wherever it closed this day, you know, you've still doubled your money in the last week, you know, assuming that you still hold it and it's at 112. So, you know, a double in a week is certainly nothing to be ashamed of, um, but it's still painful to watch what was $166 stock a couple of days ago become $112 stock today. Um, but what I did was I trimmed, you know, um, as the stock was ripping here, I trimmed here, I trimmed here, I trimmed all the way up, you know, all together sold about a third of my shares. And then after the stock got back down into the 120s, I started buying back the shares again. And I bought more shares today in the, in the you know, 115 range. I think I did buy some around 112 because I feel comfortable knowing, you know, now that I know what these numbers are gonna look like for this year, worst case scenario, not even including any auto loans, I feel very, very comfortable with this valuation at 112. I think 16 times sales for a company growing at 115% with 84% gross margins is undervalued. I honestly, I mean, looking at other uh, companies and their growth rates and their multiples, I think this should be at least back in the 150s or 160s in the next month or two. You know, once the you know the growth stocks start to find some love and you know we find a bottom here and we get some stabilization. You know, this is the type of company that I want to own and I want to continue betting on because I believe in not just the business model and their mission uh, and how much value they can add for their customers, meaning these banks, but just from fundamentals alone, the stock is a must own for me. So that's kind of how I invest. And I think, you know, if you're going to own individual stocks, this is sort of what you have to be able to do. You have to understand the company and what, these, what their products and services are, the business model, the competitive advantages, everything you talked about before. And then you have to be able to go through these fundamentals and understand the numbers and understand the valuation and be able to develop what you think are rational, you know, multiples, price targets. Um, you know, so for me personally, you know, in my experience, a company that's growing this fast with these sorts of margins um, should probably be trading at like 25, 30 times sales, honestly, um, which would put, you know, if you want, let's just say 25 times sales. So 25 times sales um, of 100 and we'll use the Yahoo number, 504, right? So 25 times 504 is 12.6 billion. And then divide that by 73 million shares. Oops. is 172. So in my opinion, even a conservative 26 times sales multiple for a company with this kind of growth and those kinds of margins and knowing how massive the credit markets are, you know, what we call their TAM, their total adjustment market, knowing how many other verticals that they can get into from mortgages to small business lending to credit cards and all this other stuff, auto loans, knowing all of that, 25 times sales is, is conservative. And that would put the stock at 172. And right now it's at 112. So you wanted to you know, take 172, subtract 112, 60, divide that by 112, you get 54. So in my opinion, the stock you know, could have 54% upside in the next let's say six months. And I think that's being conservative. So that's when I start to develop my price targets, that's kind of how I do it. You know, I have to come up with multiples and then apply those multiples to the financials or the estimates, you know, divide by shares outstanding. 
And that's where I start to see what a price target in the next three, six, 12 months might look like. Now, obviously there's other factors that come into play, you know, overall markets, sentiment, interest rates. I mean, all of that obviously matters, but a lot of that is out of my control. You know, I can't control where interest rates go. I can't control what inflation looks like. I can't control the sentiment of, you know, value, uh, value versus growth. Um, what I can control is my research. I can know my companies and understand them and have models and price targets in mind and then position these companies in my portfolio accordingly, right? So when you see that Upstart is my largest position at 14%, that's because it's my highest conviction stock right now based on current prices and where I think this stock could trade over the next six months. So when I'm building my portfolio, I'm not so worried about where I think these stocks might be in two or three years. I can't build a portfolio that way because there's just too many variables. When I build my portfolio, it's basically built on the expectations of where I think these stocks go in the next six months. And the stocks that I believe give me the most upside with the least amount of downside are going to be weighted accordingly in my portfolio. So DermTech, Food2, Mohawk, you know, it's not like an exact science. Some of this depends on, you know, um, you know trading prices throughout the day, um, new cash that came into my account and which ones I had a chance to add to, which ones have pulled back. But uh, more or less, if you look at my portfolio, this is kind of how it's constructed. It's based on my expectations, risk versus reward over the next six months. Um, now, if we're looking at, so it's going to be kind of a tough to look at the charts after the last couple of days, but there's a lot of things that broken down. But so here's a good example. So Durham Tech is still one of my favorite stocks. And this is, so this is TrendSpider for anyone who doesn't know. So I'm a big fan of TrendSpider. I use it every day. Um, so you can go into indicators here and you can set up all sorts of stuff, right? I mean, there's like, there's stuff in here I've never even heard of before, but I typically use the Bollinger Bands and the moving averages. So there's three different types of moving averages. They're simple, exponential, and weighted. The two that I use the most are simple and exponential. Um, simple is really, so if I'm doing like the simple 10 day, it's uh, literally the price, um, the price change over those 10 days uh, divided by 10. So it's like literally the average price over those last 10 days exactly versus exponential is more heavily weighted to, to towards the most recent, what they call bars or candles. So this is a bar or candle. Each one of these is its own bar candle. So simple is like the average of you know, the 10 or the 20, whatever moving average you're looking at, right? Because there's the, there's the, this is the, this is the 10, uh, let me, I'll undo all of them so you can see. So this is the 10 day simple moving average or SMA. This is the 20 day simple moving average SMA. And then there's the 50 day. So when you look at the 10 day, right, it's going to more closely track the performance of the stock over those 10 days. Um, if a stock is in a upward trend bull market, and then the 10 day moving average um, is sometimes a nice place to start adding, right? As you can see here, um, you know, like the stock bounced off the, you know, or at least it, it, it bounced here. Well, I guess it came farther down, but at least it closed above the 10 day, which is typically a bullish sign. So, but that's hard. I mean, <laughs> for these growth stocks, um, a lot of times adding on the 10 day will get you, get you in trouble because they get so volatile that they can break the 10 day very, very easily. Um, as you know, sentiment between these high growth stocks could change, uh, quite frequently or quite quickly. Um, so a lot of times I'm adding on the 20 day. So if the stock, and you can see right here, that's a perfect example where the stock you know, got a little extended, you know, bounced around, came back, pulled down, pulled back to the 20 day moving average. That would be a perfect place to add, right? 37, boom, jumped off that, you know, did its thing, came back. But this is obviously where you, go, you get yourself in trouble. So here, you know, you, you, if you had picked this as, the, as a place to add, but then here, if you had bought on the 20 day, hoping for another bounce, you would have gotten demolished, right? Because 
Uh, this was in the middle of a growth sell-off back in early March. So it went from 65 all the way down to 40, which was painful. I, I wrote it, you know, even if that's, so that's the 50 day SMA that I just added broke down through there, hundred day SMA. So we didn't get down to the hundred, thank God, but we definitely broke through the 50. Now, after the stock comes and finds support on the 50, you know, this is where things start to get, at least I was bullish, right? So, you know, as long as you kept closing above the 50, I felt like it was still, you know, bullish for the stock. And then here we got a nice bounce off and looked like we were heading much higher. And I was seeing some people say, okay, we're going back to 80. Nope. So growth stocks went back out of favor and Durham Tech got hammered again the last couple of days. So, I mean, these things can change very quickly. I mean, it doesn't matter how many times you look at charts or how, you know, how good you think are at reading charts. Um, you know, things might look really really good uh, from a technical standpoint, and then they can change real fast. So, you know, there's different ways to approach this. Um, you know, my approach is I love germ tech and I'm planning to own the stock for the next few years. So every time it pulls back, I just use it as an opportunity to add to the position with any cash that I have in my account. But there's other people that, you know, once they see this stock ripping, you know, as soon as it starts to reverse, they might put in a stop loss here to protect their profits. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, if you can, if you're, if you're that smart and you can move that quickly and you want to micromanage your account that much, then by all means, you know, you can, you can do it that way. You can set up stop losses. You can do trailing stops, um, you know, so that as the stock goes higher, the stop, the, 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 the stop loss trails with it and moves up with it. Um, so, you know, depending on what investment platform you're using, there's a lot of different ways that you can protect or hedge um, your positions. But for most people uh, that are probably watching this, if you're a long term investor, um, I wouldn't I wouldn't get like that crazy with this stuff because you're going to you, you'll probably end up making even more mistakes than just buy and hold. So that's why I still think for the majority of investors, buy and hold is the right strategy. Um, doesn't mean that you have to hold all of your stocks forever. Doesn't mean that you can't change your mind from one week to the next or one month to the next. But um, I just don't think most of us should be micromanaging or micro trading our accounts on a daily basis. Because what happens is, and I've seen it happen multiple times to myself and others, you put in the stop loss right here, right? So stock stock drops, triggers the stop loss, your stock gets sold, you end up with a, you know, maybe you end up with a small profit, stock bounces here, boom, goes up, and now you're not in the stock. And now you've, you've missed that, you know, you've missed that, that bounce. And so now you're either out of the stock completely, or you're stuck chasing it higher. So I, I just, I don't think stop losses are, are the right approach for most people, including myself. I, I almost never use stop losses, especially since, you know, I'm doing all of the research and the due diligence to build conviction in these stocks. Why do I want to get stopped out on a, on a dip only to miss the next move higher? So I'd rather use this dip as a chance to add, which is what I did today. So the stock came down. I got filled on a couple orders in here, mid fifties. Um, I forget exactly where I ended up buying it at the end of the day, but yep, it's fine. I mean, I, I still think, you know, Durham Tech could be a $100 stock maybe by at least this time next year. I think this could be a $100 stock. Um, so that's how I approach it. Um, I'm trying to think what else I can show you. I mean, I could do, I probably could do an entire lesson on charting, although I'm not even sure I'm the right person to, to do it. If you go to my YouTube channel, um, so this one, so Jonah on the trend spider stock trading pitch show. Um, I actually did talk a lot about technicals on that one. So if you actually, and I think I actually go through three or four, maybe five different stocks. Uh, so that might be a good place to start. I think this one I also did. Um, so the market chat with Richard, which was, yeah, I guess about a month ago, maybe a little bit longer. Um, I believe I actually spent some time talking about upstart. So I was pretty bullish on Upstart before anybody else even knew what Upstart was. Um, so I think people have appreciated uh, this interview because I think my interview here got a lot of people into the stock. So 
Um, now I'm just kind of bouncing around trying to kill time. So, uh, okay. I think I'm probably going to end it there. I've already gone two and a half hours, which is longer than I expected. And, uh, I'm starting to get hungry. I hope this was helpful. Um, let me just go back so you can see some of these links if you need to. Yeah. So if you want to follow me on Twitter or Substack or stock with YouTube, you know, feel free. Like I said, you know, obviously Twitter is free. YouTube is free. Uh, I charge $10 a month for Substack and StockTwit, but I think I provide a lot of value in both of them. So Substack, if you're looking for the, the weekly write-ups. So I've done weekly write-ups on, on most of my, my stocks or at least my bigger positions, which is kind of what, you know, in, in most ways, in most cases gave me the, the conviction very early on to take big positions in these companies. So I did write-ups on Futu back in uh, December, same with Upstart, Mohawk, all of those stocks are up. Uh, 3x since my write-ups. Um, and then earlier this year in January, I did one on Dermtech and then Transmedics. So uh, if you're looking to find these stocks, um, you know, early on, like I am, then I would highly recommend jumping on my Substack and subscribing for $10 a month. And then uh, Stock Twits is, you know, it's a little bit more active in there. I probably post 8, 10, 12 times a day. Uh, it's typically my kind of thoughts or commentary on the markets, you know, why I think certain things are selling off. Uh, and then of course, what I'm doing, what I'm buying and selling. Um, I'm not always right. You know, obviously uh, I make mistakes just like everybody else. I sometimes chase my stocks and try to catch a falling knife and I'm not always right. But if, if I've done the, you know, if I've done my homework and I understand the story and the fundamentals, then I don't mind you know, what I say, short-term pain for long-term gain, which just means, you know, sometimes you have to lose money in the short term. And sometimes you can't worry about trying to pick a bottom. You know, you just have to keep investing in great companies and eventually the, you know, the market will appreciate their greatness and, you know, fall in love with the stock just like you and take those stocks higher. So, you know, what I, what my approach is, is I look for great companies trading at reasonable valuations with upcoming catalysts. And those catalysts could be lots of things like, you know, beating earnings, a new product launch, FDA approval, um, you know, all sorts of stuff. But I think if you, if you figure out what the right strategy for you is, you know, whether it's value, whether it's growth, small cap, large cap, or maybe you've just, you've seen everything I've presented today and realized that owning individual stocks is a lot of work and stress. And that's just not for you. You know, you have other interests and you don't want to become a great investor. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but I still think there's a benefit to investing from an early age. And whether it's $50 a month, $100 a month, doesn't matter. Um, I think everyone should try to invest as early as possible and just be consistent, you know, and don't, don't invest every month um, based on your sentiment on the market because, if you get, if you start to get emotional about investing, it's typically when you make the most mistakes or, you know, when you want to wait for everything to look perfect, it's usually the wrong time in, to invest. You typically, the best time to invest is when things look really bad. And like I said earlier, I know that's kind of, you know, counterintuitive, but um, you sometimes kind of have to go against the, go against the grain, you know, and Warren Buffett always said, uh, be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful. And that's kind of the right way to think about investing. You know, when things are down, you want to buy. When things are up, you want to sell or trim. Um, and I'm not, I'm not always the best about selling and trimming because, you know, I fall in love with my stocks. And I, I, of course, I think they're going higher. And sometimes it's just hard to take a step back and think to yourself, okay, maybe these stocks are a little overvalued. And even though I love them, I think they're going much higher you know, maybe they've just gone too high, too fast or too far, too fast, and they're due for a pullback. And that's, you know, sometimes you are right to think that and trim because of it. And sometimes you're better just to sit on your hands and let the markets play out. And if the stocks pull back, then you do, you use some of that cash to add to your favorite positions. So, well, I hope that was helpful. Um, I just don't have time for Q&A. We just, there's a bunch of questions in the chat. I'm not even going to open it up. I just don't have time. So um, I hope this was uh, was beneficial. I hope everyone learned something that they didn't know before. 
you know, investing is not easy. Um, there's lots of ups and downs and you have to be willing to, to take that roller coaster ride. If you don't, you know, if you can't withstand the, the thought of losing money in the short term or, you know, owning stocks or being invested is going to, you know, prevent you from sleeping well at night, then <laughs> maybe find something else, you know, somewhere else to put your money. But I, I think for the majority of us, you have to just start investing. You have to figure out where to start, start slow, start small, uh, whether it's stocks, ETFs, mutual funds, just open up an account, you know, buy something, you know, whether it's, a, you know, one of your favorite companies, or if there's a sector that you really like, you know, go to ETF.com and you can find an ETF that represents that particular sector, you know, whether it's solar, EV, cybersecurity, energy, doesn't matter. Uh, I just think that everyone needs to become an investor as early as possible uh, and start to gain the experience and the education that you need to become a better investor, you know, as, as you get older. So with that said, I will sign off. Um, hope everyone enjoys the rest of your week. If you have any questions for me, you can find me on Twitter. Um, I, I try to reply to as many tweets as I can, but I'm only one person doing 15 jobs. So uh, be patient. And I'll probably do a follow-up webinar in a couple months. Maybe we'll get into a little bit more advanced stuff uh, if I can find the time to put some slides together. So until then, thank you. I appreciate everyone for taking some time with me tonight. And I wish you all the best in your investment journey. And if there's anything I can do to help, you know, please let me know.